Greetings, everyone. <laughs> and welcome to the weird world of Monster Party. Monster Party! Monster Party. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird. It's wild. It's in a world. It's, it's fantastic. Our world. It's artistic. It is all the things that we love. Horror, science fiction, yes. monsters, terror. And speaking of things that we love, who are you, sir? Oh, I'm Matt Weinhold. I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Strofe. And I'm James Gonis. And I could talk about the topic. You that, could. That we have for this show. Yeah. But I'm going to let Sean Sheridan, Why, the magic tones of Sean Sheridan, yes, my smooth introduce voice. this topic. Uh, Our guest today is a renowned artist and illustrator. He has worked in virtually every medium there is. Every Mm -hmm. medium. Mm -hmm. Every medium. I have all his recipes. We're talking (laughs) film, TV, books, animation, art exhibits, theme parks, comic strips, magazines. Uh, He specializes in horror, fantasy, and science fiction. He is, like I said, renowned all over the world. He is the one and the only... William Stout. William Stout. Oh, yeah. William Stout. Yeah. William Stout. And this hey, is... Hey, what's the episode called? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Smooth it's move. Called, it is called The Weird Worlds of William Stout. Weird, Weird Worlds of, of William Stout. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. William Stout. Stout, thank you for being here. Yes. yes. Glad you had me here. Oh, yeah. You know, you know it, it's funny. I just, really quickly, you know, we had sure. a taste. We had a, just a little taste of you. And our dirt at, 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 at yes. Monster Pal- at, on our mo- at Monster Palooza on our Monster Palooza number two episode. You're there, and we were so thrilled and honored to have you come on and just take a moment of your time to talk to us. You know how, like, when you go to Costco and they have the samples, right? And you have <laughs> right. some of the samples, and you taste one, and you go, "Oh, that's good," and you got to oh. come back for a little bit more. But then the samples are done. We we weren't oh, done. No, right. no. Oh, we if wanted you, if you the recall, full meal. We we said, you know what? I I, I know you're Mister, you're a big wig, but we we have <laughs> to do what we can to get you on our show. And you know, like you're, <laughs> yeah. We we had to send a courier to your ice chalet, <laughs> and it was hard finding you. But uh, and you know, you're, you reached you're, out. And your we appreciate work, it. your work is so infused in kind of all the stuff that we love. I mean, because even if like for our listeners. If by chance you don't know the name William Stout, you've <laughs> absolutely seen his work. Have you All been living under place. a rock? I mean, everywhere. Yeah. You've uh, got you, to know William you, Stout. You, that's what I say. I, I tell people, you <laughs> may not know who I am, but I know you've seen my work. Right, oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you have been like a concept artist for television creature designer, a production designer, storyboard artist. You're also a world traveler. You've been all over the world. You're like a wildlife enthusiast. You've been all Writer. over. You specialize in dinosaurs and just, there's so much I want to cover, but I just kind of want to ask at first what, sure. you know, in your early life when you first start doing illustrations, what were your influences as far as like drew you to like the fantastic artwork? Well, I was really lucky. My mom was a huge fan of musicals and horror movies. Wow. Oh, oh, nice. oh. M- musicals. Is she single? Matt? <laughs> Matt, musicals, he says. I like Mus- musicals. I'm, oh, 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 do you? I do. Okay, okay, that's yeah. good. Okay. My dad, he was a huge fan of westerns and science fiction. <gasps> wow. Is he single? Oh. No. <laughs> they were both gigantic fans of movies. Right. And so we would go to the drive in at least three nights a week. So that's oh. six movies because that was the days of double bills. Right, uh, right. And then on Saturday, my mom would drop my brothers and I off at the walk in theater, the Reseda theater, and we'd see more movies. Oh my gosh. That's you just heaven. You just, you just like took it all in, right? Took all it all stuff. in. Well, before we even had a television set, we, we were living in Reseda, uh, kind of a poor neighborhood. Mm-hmm. No one had TV sets back then. Right. And this is, we're talking like maybe like the 60s, this is, early 60s. Uh, 1952. Okay, okay. Well, 1952, wow. I was three years old, okay. and my parents took me to see my very first movie. Mm-hmm. I, I hadn't seen any movies until seeing this one movie at the Reseda Drive-In. Okay. 
and it was the re-release of the original 1933 King Kong. Oh King Kong. Oh, there you go. Kong. The first time you wow. see that. And wow. I think it did damage at a genetic level. <laughs> <laughs> of course. I have been nuts about Kong and nuts about dinosaurs ever since. Shortly oh after gosh. that, I saw the Rite of Spring sequence in Fantasia. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, that, right. that was it. That was it. It's been dinosaurs ever since. Did it kind of ruin every other kind of movie like for you? Like when you'd see a regular well, just a drama? Was good. You'd, yeah, you're like, like, where are the dinosaurs? It's like yeah. he's sh- showing uh, Ten Commandments. Well, where are the dinosaurs? Yeah. You know, well, that, he, that snake is kind of cool, though. Well, that that yeah. is true, but it's yeah. not. I a think dinosaur. I think Ray Harryhausen has a similar story too about when he first saw King Kong. Yeah. Also, how how it changed his life, kind of. You know. Jeez. And speaking of Ray Harryhausen, uh, one of those Saturdays, uh, my mom dropped us off at the receded Walk-In Theater to see Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Oh, wow. And awesome. man, I had been hungering to see that movie because in the Sunday comic section, they had a full-color ad page with scenes from the film. Wow, wow. And with the dragon and the cyclops and the rock and all that stuff. And I was like, I've got to see this movie. Wow. Well, I saw it, and during the intermission, I called my mom, don't pick us up. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to see it a couple more times. Oh, my gosh. Yes, so we just yeah. stayed in the theater, and I, I saw it three times that day. Pick us oh up next gosh. Thursday. And then I saw it seven times within two weeks oh at the gosh. theater. That's wow. amazing. And uh, it was the first film that made me aware of how important a motion picture score is. I became familiar with Bernard, Bernard Herrmann. Yeah. Right, right. Totally. And Man, that that film does another big life changer. That movie. So, I mean, it has everything. It, I mean, it's got a genie. It's got gold and jewels. A cyclops, dragons, yeah. and evil and magicians. Evil yeah. magicians. Yeah. Kill. A, a, kill. A skeleton. Kill. A skeleton. And a, a yummy girl. Yeah. Yes. Bing yes. Crosby's wife. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So when you went to see these movies at such an early age, you saw these monsters on the big screen. You started to draw. I mean, what got you into like actual artwork? Well. I remember I was going to see a movie, and outside the movie, in the gutter, was an issue of Famous Monsters. <gasps> what? Yeah. That's the gutter? Wow. First is, issue? Uh, is issue number three or four, the one with <gasps> the War of the Worlds cover. That's oh four. Gosh. In the gutter. Really? That's a valuable, valuable one. In the so I grabbed it, and it was, <laughs> it was missing the cover. Oh, okay. but. Man, I just what is this? Where has this been all my life? I just devoured it, and then I did you then just hang out near out. the? Did you hang out near the gutter from that point on? I was wondering where where the heck do you get these? Yeah. The gutter yeah. spits them up. Yeah, it's like Pennywise just gives them out in the sewer. Oh my yeah. God, the gutter! That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. So my parents wouldn't let me see scary movies until I was about eight years old. Okay. But because of Famous Monsters of Film and Magazine, because of my mom's interest in horror movies and my desire to draw stuff like that, I would pump my mom for information. Right, and right. Even right, so I'd no, say like, yeah. Mom, I, I want to draw a werewolf. What do they look like? Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> I'd never seen a werewolf. Right, right, right. right. right and right. she said, well, they're all hairy. So I, I drew a guy with a beard. <laughs> Ooh, scary. <laughs> well, it could have been a scary beard. Yeah, sure. There are, most of them are scary. <laughs> right. So I had this, it was, I, I called it my monster scrapbook. It was a scrapbook awesome. where I drew monsters and dinosaurs and stuff in it. Mm-hmm. And I was in the fifth grade. And I was in class, and my teacher, Mr. Wittenberg, caught me drawing when I should have been listening. Uh And I'm like, oh, I am so screwed. And he looked at what I was doing, and he said, do you have any more drawings like that? (laughs) And I was just relieved not to be in trouble. And the kid next to me said, oh, you should see it. He's got a whole book of them. It's monsters and dinosaurs. And he said, would you bring that book in tomorrow so I could see it? Nice. He's like, yeah. Oh, wow. Again, relieved I wasn't <laughs> right, being, right. getting detention or anything. And so I brought the book the next day, and he knew I was interested in, in medicine. I was going to be a doctor. Oh, wow. And, okay. Uh, and he said, Bill, I think the class needs a chart of the human skeletal system. Can you draw that up for us? <gasps> <laughs> wow. Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Bill, I, I think the class needs a chart of the human musculature system or the cross-section of the eye or cross-section of the ear. And so he was giving me all this extracurricular activity mm-hmm. that involved art and drawing and right, stuff. Right, right. And I didn't realize it, but I was teaching myself anatomy by doing this right. stuff. Oh, my God. Talk and about so, like encouraging, both encouraging parents and encouraging teachers at yeah. a young age like that. That's great. It would have been so much easier for him to just punish me. 
Right. <laughs> right. And he didn't. Right. And he right. didn't. And that's why I dedicated my first book to him. Wow. I think without Mr. Wittenberg, I wouldn't have been an artist. Wow. wow. That's amazing. That's awesome. Because he, he gave importance to what I was doing. Right, right. That's awesome. So now you started getting into, I think, one of your first kind of regular jobs. Was it comic strips? The Tarzan comic strip? Let's see. Uh, I started drawing political cartoons for the Canal News Chronicle in Thousand Oaks when I was still in high school. Wow, okay. And then they had a great policy. I went to the Chouinard Art Institute, also known as CalArts, okay. uh, back in its old location when it was across the street from MacArthur Park. And I was an illustration major, and they had a great policy in the illustration department, which was if you got any real work on the outside, you could turn that in in lieu of your homework. <gasps> oh, wow. That's wow. Nice. wow that's so a good they had a, a jobs bulletin board at school that I would check every day, and one day there was a notification that said, we are looking for an artist who likes horror, supernatural, vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> We're yeah. having a contest to do the first cover of the first issue of the magazine. Well, I submitted four pieces, and one of them they picked, and that was the first Cover for the first issue of Coven 13. Coven 13. Wow. It was Coven cool. 13. Pulp stories. Mm -hmm. Right. Harlan Ellison wrote for him, a lot of awesome. terrific writers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the editorial offices were just a couple blocks away. I went in and delivered the painting. And I said, Who are you? What are you doing about the interior illustrations? Mm -hmm. And right. the editor said, Oh, the art director's doing those. I said, Can I, can I see them? They were horrible. Just oh, awful. I said, really? How about if I do the interiors too? <laughs> Mm -hmm. So for the first four issues, I did all four covers, and I did all the interior illustrations. Wow. And that was 1968, 69. Wow. And so that really, I started supporting myself from my art from that moment on. So wow. the money was you got pretty a few good? Bucks? Not too bad? 25 bucks in the illustration. Hey! hey. That's all right. Hey, back yeah. then. Oh, sure. my God. Then, I think sure. the cover, I probably got 50. Wow. <laughs> you know? Okay. But still, yeah, yeah, that's great money. But my rent was 90 bucks a month, so... I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Another word. That's science fiction. <laughs> that was wow. a time warp. Yeah. Mm. So that led to... Then... So 1970, I, I was a big Edgar Rice Burroughs fan, the guy who wrote the oh, Tarzan. Sure. Oh, oh, sure. Oh, me too. Mars. Well, I subscribed to a fanzine called Herbdom, and they had a special issue on this undiscovered, unpublished Edgar S. Burroughs novel. It was a historical novel called I Am a Barbarian. It was uh, the story of Caligula told from the point of view of Caligula's personal slave. Oh, wow. Oh, interesting. So That's I wild. was fascinated by this, and I, I got a copy of the book, and I did a whole bunch of my own illustrations for it, and then sent them into Herbdom, and he published them. Wow. Well, a copy of that magazine got in the hands of Russ Manning, who was the guy who was writing and drawing the Tarzan of the Apes Sunday right. and daily mm -hmm. newspaper strips. Right. Mm -hmm. And he had just lost his assistant, Mike Royer, and he was looking for a new assistant, and he saw that, whoa, he lives not that far from me, because Russ was down in Orange County. And so I would drive down to, he called me up, asked me if I would like to be his assistant. I was delighted. I was familiar with his Magnus Robot Fighter comics. Loved them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. so good. And I also had his Tarzan comics he was doing for Gold Key. And what oh, yeah. shocked me about those was that's just how I pictured Tarzan in my mind when I read the novels. It was really? Russ's right. vision and mine just synced up totally. Gold Key always had some great covers, too. Yeah. They had the yeah. coolest, yeah. All their, like, horror Yeah, ones e and, even the inside yeah. art, yeah. even though sometimes it would veer off from what was actually in like the show that it was representing. Right. Mm -hmm. But the art was always interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. and Alex Toth was a regular contributor. Yeah. Fantastic right. artist. Cool. So you did that for a while. So, then. yeah. So I inked and colored the Sunday strips and inked the daily strips. Uh, Russ would always be the guy who would ink Tarzan himself, but all the rest of the stuff. Really? Okay. And then we did uh, three graphic novels together. Awesome. And that was... That was just a blast. I learned so much from Russ. He introduced me to Japanese prints. I wasn't familiar with those. He was introduced to them when he was in the Navy and he was stationed in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so Japanese prints became a big influence on my work. Russ became a big influence on my work. He showed me the uh, early Hal Foster Tarzans and Prince Valiants, mm -hmm. which oh, right. just mm -hmm. knocked me out. <clears throat> right. And so, and most important of all, Russ showed me how to be a good dad. I, he was a fantastic person, and he was a just a great father. And and uh, he fathered in a way that was totally different from my father. <laughs> you tell. He was, he was very very kind and very thoughtful. And, and when the kids would come in and ask for permission to do something, he'd give it his thoughtful consideration instead of just saying no or leave me alone. I'm working. You know, mm -hmm. he'd, right. <clears throat> he'd stop everything just to pay attention to them. It was right. great. Cool. So now where did that lead? Because I know eventually you were working at Playboy too, right? Right. So 
This is like Playboy magazine in, in the 60s, right? Playboy is, magazine, James, maybe? Heard Playboy? Of them? Anyone? Heard of Anyone? Yeah. Playboy? <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Yeah, a lot of Playboy ex-employees yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so while I was working for Russ, I was also doing my own comic book stories for Peterson Publications. I was doing work for a magazine called Cycle Tunes. It was comic book stories about motorcycles. Okay. Which is <laughs> kind of funny because I knew nothing about motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But the editor, Dennis Alfson, gave me some really good advice. He said, I, I can tell you don't know anything about motorcycles. He says, go to the toy store today and buy a model kit and pose that and use that to draw from oh, oh right. that's, that's a great idea oh that's yeah. great I can do that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah so I was able to write and draw my own stories and around that time I discovered uh, the EC comics and especially Mad and oh, Panic yeah. and I was mm-hmm. blown away by the work of Kurtzman and Elder yeah. and Wally Wood sure sure and so I did a story that was sort of a tribute to those three guys called Motor Psycho and when it was published I sent it off to them, and I got a letter back from Harvey Kurtzman asking me if I would like to be his assistant on Little Annie Fanny and work with him and Will Elder. What? No. Wow. Now, and now, so can, they, for, for our uh, listeners, sure. can you, you know, tell us about Little Annie Fanny? And, and, and please describe it slowly. <laughs> <laughs> so prior to Little Annie Fanny, uh, Harvey Kurtzman and Willie Elder had a, a strip and a character called Goodman Beaver that was printed, printed in Help magazine. Right. And in one of the stories, uh, the stories was Goodman goes playboy. And he, he goes, he meets, he meets the devil. And, and of course. <laughs> uh, duh. Well, Hefner saw that and Hefner is a, it was a frustrated cartoonist his whole life. And a, yeah. and a big monster fan, horror sure, fan. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Just loves movies, too. Right, so right. he decided he wanted to do a magazine with Kurtzman and Elder. Right. And separate so, from Playboy. This, separate this from Playboy, be... it was a magazine called Trump. Nice. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> Believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> Trump. Yeah. Okay. Let's make magazines great again. <laughs> <laughs> And it was it was like Mad Magazine, but in full color. Wow! It was okay. St- really wow. expensive magazine, or as, or as Hefner put it when he was talking to Harvey, he said, "You know, I I said there's no limit to what you can spend on this, but you've exceeded that limit." <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <Right>. And <laughs> at a, after the first two issues came out, the third one was almost ready, but. Hefner was in a financial bind, and he had a choice. I can either keep publishing Playboy or keep publishing Trump. Guess right. which one? Right. Uh, 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 hmm. I think he made the right decision. Yeah. He still wanted to work with Kurtzman and Elder. He still wanted some element of cartoon, right. comic and so strips. so he suggested, well, Harvey suggested that they do Goodman Beaver as a strip in Playboy. Mm-hmm. Like an ongoing. And yeah. Hefner said, why not make Goodman a female? Right. And that became Little Annie Fanny. Little mm-hmm. Annie right. Fanny. So it was a full My color, first love. Incredibly <laughs> beautifully painted. Every page was painted. Right. When I saw the my first originals, they looked like Persian miniatures, just jewel-like in their <laughs> right. detail. And the, and the char- no, no, the character, I remember this as Annie Fanny, was, she was you know incredibly buxom, blonde, yes. but like but very innocent, innocent and kind of naive yes. yeah. about everything. You had all the salacious people around her, but she was always, and she, of course, was like always naked somehow. Yeah, but, she was candid. Or, yeah. She was an innocent in a world uh, right. that wasn't. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And, that, and it ran for quite a while in the magazine, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like you, Larry. <laughs> yes, I, I guess you're right, man. Yeah. And innocent. In the so, world of, right. so he flew me out to New York, and it was my first time in New York, and uh, it happily it coincided with the very first EC comic book convention. <gasps> oh, so no. I was oh, wow. able, able to eat, able to eat, <laughs> able to meet all of my heroes. Uh, uh, you, hopefully, you had something to eat. Too. <laughs> you got to eat. Well, I, I had a, those New York delis. Oh, of course. don't get me started. Yeah. So I, I got to meet Wally Wood. I got to meet oh Al Williamson, gosh. Roy Crinkle, Frank Frazetta, George oh. Evans. You wow. met Frank Frazetta. Yeah. Wow. And what, wait a minute. Wally Wood? Yeah. What was he like? Wally Wood. Well, I met Wally Wood my first night in New York. I got invited to a party on Staten Island, and uh, I walked into the home where the party was going on, and I walked into the kitchen. There's Wally Wood sitting at the kitchen table, and I went... Oh my God! It's Wally Wood, and I went, Mister Wood. 
I, I just got to tell you, you, you've been a gigantic influence on me. And he said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> but perfect. For, so, but perfect. But perfect. Burst but, that balloon. <laughs> but, but for listeners who are not, who not familiar with him, what would he be famous for doing? Oh, oh my God. Oh, okay. Okay. His yeah. Like, I'm an idiot. Okay. Pretty limitless. He could do yeah. great funny stuff and the funniest stuff you've ever seen, but he also do great superhero stuff and yeah. serious stuff as yeah. well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he created the most of the Thunder Agents. Um, let's see where else. Oh, well, he did weird fantasy, weird science, mm-hmm. all, all all those like some of the yeah. best EC science fiction We're artwork. Was Wally, Wally. Wally. Yeah, Wally. yeah, yeah, Amazing. yeah, really great. In fact, he did one whole story just about himself called My World. Which was I remember I that one. Yeah, yeah, I know yeah, that yeah, one. Incredibly yeah. good. It, it included. It was a five page story that uh, at least five pages, that included everything that Wally loved to draw. Yep. Yeah. It, it awesome. was fantastic. Yeah. I I know that one. I did not know that was Wally Wood. So. Yeah. Amazing talent. I know he had kind of a sad life, yes. but uh, yeah. died died in this town. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. But he was a hell of an artist. One of my influences. One of my favorite artists. Yeah. So you were kind of now in this. So here I'm know, working for Kurtzman and Elder, and I get, I'm getting to work with Willie Elder, one of the most amazing cartoonists and comic book artists who ever lived. He had this talent that is so rare, and that he could do a drawing, and you wouldn't have to know the context of the story. You wouldn't have to know who the character was. You could just look at it, and you would laugh. He could draw <gasps> funny. Really? Right. <clears throat> just amazing. And my favorite story of his was in Mad Number no. 2. It was about Melvin Mole. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, my my dad, I think, still has. And I remember as a little kid, he has issue number one of Mad. Yeah. It's like it's like with the the cover, like the big shadow monster mm-hmm. coming out. And he's like, it's Melvin, or whatever. Yeah, and like, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah it's, I I remember reading through that. It's got to be worth a lot of money. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Willie Elder was famous in his youth for doing really crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. He'd go to the butcher shop and he'd buy a whole bunch of meat, cheap meat and stuff. And then he'd go down to the subway and he'd throw it on the tracks. And when the train came <laughs> by, he'd go, what? the train, the train ran over Billy. <laughs> <laughs> and every single person who had a kid named Billy oh my God. Would, would look down on the tracks and see all this meat. <laughs> <laughs> that is unbelievable. That, that sounds like something you would do, Matt. That's genius. <laughs> that is oh, genius. Wow. So when That's Willie classic. was in the was in the army, he was on leave. He was still too young to drink. He, he wasn't twenty one yet. Mm-hmm. But he and his buddy were determined they were going to get served at a bar in New York. <laughs> right. And so Willie said, "I know what we'll do." Um, and he got this water bottle, and uh, he filled it with stew, and he put it down his shirt. <laughs> And then he said, okay, we're going to go into this place, and we're going to pretend like we're slightly drunk, like we've already been served, so it's okay to serve us. Good logic. But but Willie had a real baby face. He didn't have any beard or anything, just smooth. His his friend got served no problem because his friend looked a lot older than he was. Right. But the bartender's looking at Willie. He goes, no way is this guy 21. Uh Uh-huh. And so the bartender said, well, plus you, you guys have been drinking. I think you're too drunk, and Willie's feigned outrage what are you talking about drug? i'm just fine i'm just fine i just oh i'm not feeling so good oh, oh my god and he grabs his stomach which causes all the stew in the water bottle to right. come out of his look like it's coming out of look his like mouth. he's vomiting right. and all over the bar oh. and now the patrons are going to Oh my God! The guy just threw up on the bar, and the bartender says, "I knew it! I knew you're too drunk! You guys gotta get out of here!" And Willie says, "What's the problem? You never seen a guy throw up before?" And he <laughs> takes a fork and he starts eating the stew. <gasps> no! Oh my God! Oh, and that's so pre now the bar great is, Santini has been cleaned right. out. <laughs> no one's there anymore. Oh my gosh! But that's the kind of guy Willie was. Wow! So I, was that like a common gag? Because like Great Santini does that. Years later, really? wow. yeah. oh yeah, that's right, oh, right. But that is hysterical. Yeah. Wow. So by the time I met Willie, though, he was he was very kind and very gentle and very, very <clears throat> actually very fatherly towards mm-hmm. me. And uh, he had this painting on the wall. It was a beautiful little scene of of a house and the trees and all this stuff, and it would change with the seasons. If it was winter time, everything would be covered in snow. He'd paint it. <laughs> Oh, wow. Wow. Oh, that's awesome. And he kept changing it. So if you were familiar with the painting, you, you do a, a double take. <laughs> wow. 
We need hide it's, stuff. After it's like, years, it's wow. it, night it was, gallery. Yeah. It's yeah. Cool. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Funny stuff. So cut to two, year 2000. I'm at Comic-Con, and uh, they're having the last great gathering of all the EC guys. Every living oh. EC artist mm-hmm. is wow. here in San Diego uh-huh. right, at the convention. And I was assigned to take care of Willie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, by that time, Willie had become pretty frail. Right. And uh, we were at the banquet together, the awards banquet. And it was a uh, buffet style, and Willie wanted to get a second helping. I said, well, let me help you. And so we started slowly walking towards the buffet table, and I'm, I've got him cradled in my arms. Mm-hmm. And suddenly he stops, and he looks up at me, and he says, Bill, now you're my dad. Oh, jeez. Oh, oh, my gosh. That's great. That's, that's great. One of the greatest moments of my life. Wow. It's just such yeah, that's that guy. generation of artists, you yeah. know. I mean, that's yeah, the greats. Yeah, they really. really are. They really are. And just the legacy of that whole generation of artists kind of like, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. really. Absolutely. Yeah, the ECs were a gigantic <clears throat> influence on oh, me. Oh, totally. I, I did, in the mid-1970s, I did a, a series of 45 bootleg record album covers. Yes, yes. I used to trade the originals for ECs. Wow, that's, awesome. That's how I, I completed a whole EC collection. Oh, my gosh. That. And you did, and then you also did some work for Heavy Metal Magazine, right? Yeah, I was one of the first American contributors to that. 76, 77? And actually, that before started? I contributed to Heavy Metal, I contributed to the French magazine that was the original source of Heavy Metal called Metal Hulon. Really? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Huh. I th- I thought heavy metal was like an American. I knew it was like no, no, French. No. The first, yeah. Gosh, I and think about the first thirty issues was all reprints from the French magazine. Right. Yeah. Right. So when, as the seventies went on, then when you kind of late seventies, you started to get into motion pictures, right? You started to do yeah. So well, how'd you make that fell, transition? Yeah, fell though. into that business yeah. accidentally. I was doing movie posters, which actually. The business of movie posters has almost no relationship whatsoever with the business of making movies. Two separate worlds. <laughs> right, right. Really? Uh, I worked on the ad campaigns for about 120 motion pictures. And uh, Wizards was one of your first um, That was one posters, of my very right? first posters. Love that and poster. It's really great. Probably Iconic. Posters, so, yeah. My best known work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's oh. fantastic. So I was busy doing movie posters. And uh, at the same time, I was a huge Robert E. Howard fan. And a friend of mine was Bob Greenberg was working as a production assistant on the Conan the Barbarian movie that John Millius was writing mm-hmm. and directing. Oh yes, and I oh. found out that Ron Cobb was the production designer. Well, that uh, blew yep, my yep, mind yep, yep. because I knew Ron as a political cartoonist. He did the cartoons for the L.A. Free Press. That's okay. where I knew his work, and okay. I thought, what is this guy going to do with Conan? <laughs> I, I'm intrigued. <laughs> now I was aware that he had worked on Alien, that he designed the Nostromo and and the suits. I think the space yeah, suits. Yeah, they're right? great yeah. suits. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I was intrigued, but I was too busy to take time off to go to the Conan offices and see all this mm-hmm. stuff. Finally got a break in my schedule, and but instead of going to the Conan offices, I decided to go to the ABA. It's the American Booksellers Association Fair. Happens uh, once a year, usually either in New York or L.A., sometimes Vegas, sometimes Chicago, but usually uh, L.A. or New York, and it was in L.A. that year. And it's a great place for an illustrator to pick up work because it's every single publisher and every single editor in the entire country in one big room. Wow, right. So I could just go booth to booth to booth, show my portfolio, and pick up work for the year. Wow. So Jeez. that was the plan. But the first person I ran into there was Ron Cobb. <gasps> no. And Ron said, Bill, you're my first choice of who I want to work with in the art department on Conan. But I have a, an agreement with John Millius, the director. He has veto power over anybody I want to bring into the film. Mm-hmm. So would you mind leaving your samples uh, so that John could see them? Right. And I thought, well, making movies, that might be fun to learn how to make movies. <laughs> <Sure>. Maybe. <laughs> and so I said, yeah, sure. So the next day I went in, and John happened to be there, mm-hmm. and I handed him the book. He flipped through it, and there was a Harlan Ellison story I had illustrated for Heavy Metal that he just loved called Shattered Like a Glass Goblin. Yeah. And he'd remembered that story from Heavy Metal, and then he flipped through the rest and handed me back the book. And John's a sort of bigger-than-life guy, mm-hmm. and as he's walking out the room, he reaches the doorway, and over his shoulder he yells, hire him. <laughs> so I went in to talk to Buzz Feichens, our line producer, and uh, Buzz told me what I'd be making on Conan, and I nearly fell off the chair laughing because it was about 10% of what I was making in advertising. Oh, um, really? But I thought, well, it's just for two weeks, mm-hmm. you know? Right, right. Well, what I found out later is when you get hired on a film, it's always for two weeks mm-hmm. because if you don't work out, if you're a jerk, they can let you go, right, and, sure. and there's no hard feelings. Your time's up. 
so the two weeks turned into two years <laughs> and turned into a film career. Oh and uh, boy, talking about being at the right place at the right time. When I first started working there, our receptionist was Kathleen Kennedy. Wow. Really? Oh my gosh. Within two months, she was John Milius's personal assistant. Within two months after that, she was Steven Spielberg's personal assistant. And then two years later, she produced E.T. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. wow. Little movie. Maybe you've heard of yeah. that? Not, uh, not, not familiar. No. E.T., no. you know, a heartwarming story. No. No. I have no heart, so okay. no. All right. So John was working with Steven. He was producing 1941 for Steven. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we were sharing offices. So right across <clears throat> from my office was Steven Spielberg's office. Mm -hmm. So Ron Cobb and I would work on Conan during the day and then run across to Steven's office and we kick around ideas with Steven for his next project, which was Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh. <laughs> That I know. I thought it was always <laughs> going to be like that. <laughs> right. But after Conan the Barbarian, I did uh, First Blood. I storyboarded all the action sequences. Really? Wow. 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 Then did the second Conan film. And at that point, uh, well, when I was on the first Conan film, I, I snuck this little book, and I had it with me everywhere. It was How to Speak Italian. Because I wanted to listen in to the De Laurentiis family whenever they were having their <laughs> private discussions. Because whenever they want, didn't want anyone to hear what they were saying, they'd all speak Italian with each other. Right. right. You know, you could pretend to go in drunk and yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ooh, crab Chapino. So, the De Laurentiis family, they were impressed that I was learning Italian for uh -huh. that purpose. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. And so, for the second Conan film, they started grooming me to become a production designer. And they let me design about two thirds of that film. Wow. 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 It was nice. Uh, did you work on Buck Rogers too a little bit? Oh yeah, that actually I did Buck Rogers prior to Conan. That was seventy eight, seventy nine. What kind of, what kind of stuff did you design for that? Originally, it was going to be three two hour movies for Europe, and in the middle of making it, they changed their mind and decided to make a TV series for the United States. But then the theatrical for version, you know, they did a theatrical release, and then they showed that as a pilot on TV later. I never saw it. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, now, now, consider yourself lucky. <laughs> now, but, but, I just but I was you. designing uh, costumes and creatures and spaceships did and weapons. Yes, and but all, yeah, all that really, stuff is great. But what we really want to know is, did you have anything to do with Tweaky? The robot. No. Uh -huh. I haven't curious. seen the show, so I'm just okay. Yeah, well, there, there's let's a, just there, say there's a penis-shaped <laughs> robot named Tweaky, <laughs> which is why. I, you oh, know. then maybe I did. <laughs> 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 so this is like this is the early '80s when there was this little explosion of like practical effects and you know horror sci-fi was huge. Now, well, it know. was funny because at that time, I had all these friends that were in the film business and they were just beginning to get into the business, just starting to get work. Rick Baker was a really close friend of mine. He wow. he just done It's Alive and he'd done Squirm. Squirm. And, uh, squirm. Mick Love Garris. Squirm. Mick Garris squirm. was a friend of mine. Mick <laughs> Squirm. No. <laughs> yeah, Mick Garris. Uh, right, yeah. right. He was hosting a show for the Z Channel, which was I the, love the best, Z channel. best cable oh, channel. I love that. That's true. Right. Introduced him right. to so many kind of cult films and foreign yeah. films that we never would have seen. Plus, Z also helped finish or, or restore films that had been cut. Yes, before people were doing that. Yeah, you know, right. yeah. That, was, that was a great, great channel. So Mick had a, a show on Z Channel where he would interview horror directors. That's right. He was, and then he had ended up doing, started like directing behind the scenes, you right. know, documentaries, kind of like the featurettes that you would see later. And, and, and then movies. finally directing films themselves, right. directing all the Stephen King films and uh, mm, right. doing uh, oh, amazing Masters stories. of Horror, Masters yeah, of horror. series, totally. Yep. Um, if we can just go back a little bit to sure. your movie posters. Yeah. I am a gigantic Ramones fan. Oh, and of course, one of my favorite movies of all time is Rock and Roll High School. Mm -hmm. And I love that movie. I think it's it's funny. It's got great rock and roll stuff. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful showcase for the Ramones. It is. A great movie. And that poster is just amazing. Oh, thank you. And I want to tell you, because I'm such a fan of yours, that I went on to Wikipedia. Yeah. And I fixed Wikipedia for you. Oh, thank you. Because, <laughs> you know, Wikipedia, you can't fix your own. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, really? So there's all kinds of stuff in there that I know I didn't do or, or I got credit for or that I didn't Ridiculous. get credit for. And I can't change it myself. So other people have to change yeah. it for it to be valid. Because so they thank had, you. yeah, the original, they had as the artist, they had uh, the guy who did uh, the Animal House. Oh, Rick Marowitz. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 this is wrong. And I'm telling you, <laughs> I have never touched Wikipedia yeah. for any other purpose than this. <laughs> wow. You know how you, like, people can change things back if they want sure. to? 
Yeah. It's right there to this day. Awesome. Yeah. Now, I, now, I just want to point out, you know, you bring up a really interesting thing. You know, uh, Bill has done a lot of different posters. And, I mean, the Rock and Roll High School one, it's it's interesting because it's it's kind of like little caricatures of people yeah. a little bit. But, but, but hits see, them perfect. But, Everyone is, but is see, perfect. This is the amazing thing about, about William is he, you got that style. But then I've seen other things like with Conan, it's more like a, a realistic style. And then I've seen your monsters that you've done to the dinosaurs and they're like reptilians. You have all of these different styles. It's not like like when you say, oh, I'm, I am I paint like Van Gogh. Well, you have one particular style, but you have many yeah. different styles. Not too many people can go back and forth from like a, a cartoon Realis- to, to realistic. realistic to somewhere in between. I, I attribute that to two things. Short attention span. <laughs> <laughs> You're in good company. <laughs> and uh, the way I was taught at art school. Oh. there were When I was going to art school, there were two big art schools in Los Angeles, Art Center and Chouinard. Mm-hmm. And at, if you were an illustrator at Art Center, they t- would teach everybody to draw in the exact same style. Hmm. It was very commercial okay. style. Mm-hmm. You'd graduate, you'd have a comfortable living. Okay. At Chouinard, they would look at what you were doing and make you a better you. And so mm-hmm. they were more interested in developing individuals. Mm-hmm. And... My approach to problem solving is let the problem dictate the solution. I would never try to force one style as the solution to all the different graphic problems I was encountering. Oh. And so I would let, let the problem itself dictate the style. Mm-hmm. Now, in the, in the case of Rock and Roll High School, uh, I love doing posters for Roger Corman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because when I normally I worked for a guy named Tony Seiniger who was doing about 80 to 90 percent of all the movie posters in town. Mm-hmm. And when I would work for him, I'd do, you know, a couple dozen roughs, and then I'd do uh, several black and white comps and a few color comps. Well, by the time I got to doing the final poster, I'd drawn it about 40 times, <laughs> and I was sick of it. But now, this is the one the public's going to see. you got to get all juiced up and get all right. that energy back and, and somehow pull that off and, yeah. and make that the, the best of what you've done. Mm-hmm. Well, Roger didn't want to pay for all those sketches and roughs and comps. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so I could do a, a, a quick rough in my sketchbook, show it to Roger, and he'd say, go to finish. <laughs> <laughs> so all the energy would go into that poster. It, ha- it hadn't been dissipated yet, so it was fantastic. Well, now, when I got kind, the kind rock- of like the filmmaking process, he's like, get it down. Yeah, in, do it. Yeah. Three days. Yeah. Did, did, what, what are some of the posters you did for Corman? Well, like, well oh, okay. Wait no. oh. So, so when I got the Rock and Roll High School gig, uh, Roger said, "Bill, do anything you want." As long as it looks like Animal House. Oh. <laughs> is that what he said? Wow. I can see that totally. Yeah. Oh my god. But you know what's funny is that it, to me, to my eye, it does not look like Animal House. It looks like it's in the same kind of family, but like that has way more energy. The idea that you got the whole school exploding, yeah. and there's action to every single character yeah. in that poster. I, I think a lot of that is uh, Willie Elder influence. Mm-hmm. He was great at hiding what Kurtzman called eyeball kicks in all his stories. Uh-huh. Just you'd read the comic book, you'd read a mad story, and you go panel to panel and you'd read the story. But then Willie would put in all these little tiny jokes within each panel right, that didn't right. necessarily relate to the story. They were just there to make you laugh. Right, mm-hmm. right. And so that that was sort of my approach to that poster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just pops. It's like a movie in and of itself. So the film was being edited while I was doing the poster. So I was sent to the editing place, which was just actually a f- few blocks from my apartment on Beachwood Drive in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And inside this room is Alan Arkish and Joe Dante. And it's like two kids in a candy store. They are having the time of their lives <laughs> cutting this movie. And they're so excited. They go, you got to see this scene we just did. You, you, you're not going to believe it. And it was That's infectious. Awesome. It was so much fun. And that's the thing about the the 70s and early 80s. That was when making movies was really fun. Mm -hmm. And if you were a young person and want to get into films, there weren't all the barriers and blockades because you could approach Roger Corman and pitch him and get a yes or no on the spot. You wouldn't have to go through the chain of command of the big studios. I don't know how many many guests we've had on the show where they have stories about, yeah, I just looked up, you know, Vincent Price in the phone book and just called him and said hi and we went to this house. You know, like... Yeah. That's, well, that's another that. huge evangel living in L.A. Stan Laurel was listed in the phone book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. He yeah. just yeah. had a guest who, uh, who who said that very thing. He right. uh, 
we had uh, Rich Carell, who's a huge, uh, a huge a science t- fiction science collector, fiction he's horror, a t- he's collector. a TV, horror and he's yeah. a TV director. But um, he had the exact story where he looked up Stan Laurel on the phone and called him and talked to him yeah. and, and went to his house. <laughs> yeah. Now I just sort of an opposite thing. My very first day in New York, I walked into a phone booth and I opened up the phone book. Steve Ditko. Uh, uh-huh. yeah. yeah. And it was just enough for me. It says Steve Ditko artist, and then it had his address and phone number. Was, I didn't call him because it was enough for me to know he really exists. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. God, that's, God. great feet. That's amazing. Great. Amazing so, feet. So some of Fantastic the Fantastic uh, Hands. Yeah. <laughs> what were some of the uh, Corman movies then that you did posters for? So I did uh, Lady in Red. John Sales. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Uh, mm-hmm. Up from the Depths. Uh, oh. Right. Right. A much better poster than the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw the movie, but I, 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 I kind of had that feeling. Yeah, yeah. And then Roger bought my first screenplay. Before we get sure. into that, I want to ask you um, speaking of movie posters, because this is something we've talked about before in the show, how today, it seems like just no the art. art of movie posters no, there's just no doesn't it's exist. It's, it's all it's photos so and Photoshop. It's so sad. It's like, it seems to have been like the mid-80s when it started to kind of happen. And it was like, the advent of Photoshop. Yeah. yeah and, and when and they do do art, it's a, an homage, you know? Yeah, yeah. But like, I mean, that's that's something I miss so much. It's oh, just me too. Like I, would, I feel artwork. like I was working in the last golden age of movie posters. Because yeah. I'd walk yeah. into Seinegger's and, and there would be Dan Guzet's poster for Streets of Fire would look like Russian agit props. <laughs> yes! Yeah. 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 Or, uh, I have uh, that poster. Pe- that's a beautiful uh, Pete poster. Pete uh, Travel With My Aunt. It looks like uh, Toulouse the Trek or Drew Struzan doing this combination of J.C. Leyendecker meets Alphonse Mucha. <laughs> and it was just the most exciting, thrilling place to be if you were yeah. an artist. Yeah. I wish, that, I wish it would come back. I mean, it's just because I, I really miss that. You know? I hope like with music and everything else that certain art forms kind of hit a wall yeah. and then there's that yeah. time where they can kind of reinvent themselves again. We're just seeing like a big close-up of the star's face as the poster. Like, no, it's boring. Half white, half in black. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. It's boring. Dull. Know, so boring. It's so boring. Yeah. Uh, but, so Deuce Duzan was the, sort of the last guy standing. Yeah. To, Last artist to be hired to do movie posters, and that would be, was because of the insistence of uh, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. Is, and, is he the one who did like Raiders of the Lost Ark? Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are beautiful, beautiful. So uh, Guillermo del Toro commissioned him to do a poster for Hellboy, and oh, after okay. it was finished, he invited Guillermo to the, his home to see the poster and, and to see the art. And Guillermo's looking at it. He's like, "Oh my God, this is fantastic! This is the greatest thing I've ever seen! Oh, I can't wait to see this as the poster." And at that point, Drew walked over and put his hand on Guillermo's shoulder and said, Oh, Guillermo, you're just about to find out how little power you actually have. Oh. And they didn't use it. Oh, no. Geez. That's terrible. So a couple years <laughs> later, they're at Comic-Con, Drew Struzan, Guillermo del Toro, and an executive from Warner's, and they're promoting Hellboy 2. Mm-hmm. And a kid in the audience raises his hand. He says, I just saw that amazing painting by Drew Struzan. And the Guillermo said, yes, I, I commissioned that. And he says, is that going to be the one sheet? And the Warner's executive looks at the kid, <laughs> ponders it for a moment, and says, nope. Looks too much like art. What? <laughs> what? Wow. That's the response? Did he yeah. get out alive? Like, how does he torches? <laughs> and, you know, like, oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's, it's that's so the mentality? It looks like art? Yeah, it looks too much like art. Isn't the idea Jeez. to get you excited about the movie, to make yeah. you want to go see it? And yeah. what he didn't realize is that, you know, one of the reasons they, they love photographs in Photoshop is because... If it's a photograph of Sean Connery, they know it's Sean Connery because it's a photograph of Sean Connery. Right. What they don't realize is that Drew Struzan can make it look more like Sean Connery than any photo. <laughs> right. Sure. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. Well, and also, how many of those posters have saved a movie? Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It's like, it's like album covers. Yeah. yeah. You know? How many album covers I went, oh, this has got to be good. Look how great this, yeah. this is going to be the hardest rocking. And then you play <laughs> like, no, no, that's, not at that's all. That's why I went to see Up From The Depths. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was going to be a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> but like they, they don't get yeah. that through their heads. Like the poster will get you in the door. Yeah. yeah. The other opportunity young filmmakers had was Canon films. Oh yes. Oh, yeah. Canon yeah. set up in LA. Like, like guns blazing back it was, then. It was unbelievable. At, at at that time, the most pictures in production for a major was Warner Brothers. I think they had six. Canon had sixty four. <laughs> yeah. They were insane. They were out of control. It was I mean, unbelievable. But in a good way. If you were a young filmmaker, you could 
meet Menachem, the head of the company, yeah. pitch right. him, and get a yes or no on the spot. Right, if, if I know. You, like I know. Corman, if you if you said yes, you get your shot to make the film. You wouldn't right. get much money, but you get a chance sure. to make your movie. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. I know. Such, you're, like uh, you said, it's such a great time. Great yeah. times. Uh, as you said, like this in the early 80s uh, for Corman, you actually wrote some scripts, too, for some movies. Now, you yeah. were involved in some of the writing for one of my favorite Corman films, Galaxy of Terror, yep. right? Galaxy now, of Terror. Did you wrote the original treatment or Yeah, the original treatment this? for that. So that was your concept. Mm-hmm. That's, that's fantastic. We all love, love that, that movie. movie. Oh, cool. James oh, Cameron yeah, worked on that. I know he did a lot of the art direction yeah. on that. But then another film, which he wrote the screenplay for, which was in the sword and sandal kind of sorcery right. films at the time, uh, The Warrior and the Sorceress. With David Carradine. David Carradine. Yeah. And this is kind of like a... There, there's other movies like this, like Sorceress and Barbarian Queen, and this movie has the. Distinct- Can they share an apartment? But it's a fun movie, and this movie it has a distinction to me. I don't know of any other movie that has this, but this is a movie where the lead actress who plays the sorceress is pretty much topless through the whole movie. Oh. She, her, but her outfit is designed to be topless. Was that your Good idea? Times. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. Please I'm, say I'm it was. Of, I'm more proud of the wasp woman with the four breasts. Oh, oh yes, oh, that's true too. Right. Yeah. That's so, right. More to love. <laughs> breasts <laughs> everywhere. A lot of happy babies. <laughs> so the way this came about, I got a call out of the blue from a guy. His name is John Broderick. John had worked as a assistant director for Roger on Big Bad Mama. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. And Andy Dickinson. He, he's and he he said. Uh, at that time, in addition to movie posters, I did what's called presentation art, which are fake movie posters to get film projects sold. Right, right. Uh, every year, Sandy Howard would come to me. He'd have 12 <laughs> right. titles. He'd go, okay, Terror Train. Teenage girls terrorized on a train. So I would do, <laughs> I'd do a little fake movie poster of that. And, I, and so he'd go to the Cannes Film Festival or, or MIFED in Italy with 12 pictures and 12 titles. No scripts. Mm-hmm. And get financing for all twelve films based upon Amazing. the art. Incredible! Mm-hmm. So <laughs> incredible. Uh, I see you got Reanimator up here. Yes. Oh yeah. I, I did the original presentation art that got the financing for Reanimator. Really? Oh, oh nice. my gosh! Yeah. We've had Stuart Gordon and Jeffrey, Jeffrey yeah. Combs on our show. Both yeah. lovely people. Oh, oh my Stuart's gosh. Are great. Guys. Yeah. That's awesome. Incredible. So she did some of these for Corman. Right. So John Broderick uh, said, uh, "Are you familiar with Gore?" Now, I thought he was talking about G-O-R-E. Right, right. I said, yeah, love that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> he was talking about G-O-R, which was a, a sort of pornographic sword and sorcery series of novels by right. John Norman. Right. And we get together, and, and he starts talking about this movie he wants to do, and I end up writing it. Now, was it sp- actually based on gore? Or was like a, Not just as a knockoff? It Not was like the, Okay, right. No, I, did, I wanted your, your version something original. Or, right, yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. I had read as long as there were four breasts. I, read, I think the <laughs> first or, or first two Gore books and just wasn't impressed. Yeah, okay, right, right. It's yeah, sleazy stuff. <laughs> right. So, yeah. um, I've completely forgotten that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, John goes out to pitch the film, and he comes back and says, "I couldn't couldn't get anybody interested in it." So I forgot about it and went back to doing movie posters. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and I I call up the art director at Corman's uh, several months later to remind him I'm here and also see if there's any work out there. And I think, you know, what are you working on? He says, oh, we're doing a promotion for a film called Cane of Dark Planet. I go, Cane of Dark Planet? Uh, I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> that was your script? <laughs> and, and I said, have, have you got a copy of the script handy? Go, oh, yeah, I got one right here. I said, okay, what does the first page say? It says, Cane of Dark Planet by John Broderick. I go, and? <laughs> and there's dead silence. No. I'm going, are you kidding me? John ripped me off? Wow. wow. So I immediately called my attorney, and, yeah. the, and the attorney called Roger. Roger immediately sent me a check, which he took out of John's pay. Oh, <laughs> nice. That became the worry and the sorcerer? So, well, uh, after it was made, uh, Roger called me up. He said, Bill, would you like to see the poster for your film? Mm-hmm. So I drove over to New World. <laughs> And there's the poster, and the film is no longer Can of Dark Planet. It's now called Warrior and the Sorcerers. And I said, Roger, that, that looks fantastic. And, and David Carradine was my first choice to be in the film. Right. Uh, but there's no sorceress in the movie. And he said, Bill, you have to understand <laughs> <laughs> that by calling it Warrior and the Sorcerers, we can put a beautiful, sexy woman on the poster. That will get 
butts into seats. <laughs> Once we have their money and they're seated in the theater, who cares if there's a sorceress? <laughs> That's a good Corman impersonation. He's, he's, he's got a point. That's true. Oh, That's true. man. <laughs> so I go to see the movie at the World Theater. Now, if you're not familiar with the World Theater, it was a grindhouse. <laughs> right. Three movies, 99 cents. Wow. <laughs> One of my favorite favorite places to see films. Uh, it smelled like the inside of an old shoe. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first place I saw Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, nice. wow. And I wasn't going to see it because I thought, well, this is just some gore fest. And, yeah. But I read an interview with Bernie Wrightson, uh -huh. the creator of Swamp Thing, yeah. and Bernie said the film was so scary it made him pee his pants. And I said, I got to see this film. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Okay. So I'm seated, I'm ready, and I hear a bit of a commotion in the back behind me, and I turn around, and here comes five guys in tuxedos accompanying Zsa, Zsa Gabor <laughs> what? to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Wow. <laughs> what? You're kidding. Only in L.A. <laughs> you know? Holy shit. So she sat and watched Texas yeah. Chainsaw? Yeah. <laughs> While she was curious like you, did you she know? say anything during the film like, he's wearing someone's face, darling? <laughs> <laughs> Thank God, that's bizarre. Mm. Oh, my God. Wow. So, Do you think she liked it? <laughs> Who knows, oh, I yeah. guess. But. Oh, my God. So that's where I saw the war in the sorceress. And as the film is unspooling on the screen before me, I am getting sinking lower and lower <laughs> into my seat because I realize, oh, my God, John has taken my screenplay, and he's turned it into a plagiaristic ripoff of Yojimbo. Oh. oh. <laughs> like, oh. Right, right. I, f I was just completely embarrassed. What uh, was the credit finally on the film? I think a uh, story by me and then screenplay by me and John. So. Oh, okay. Oh, so oh, that's a little yeah, better. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Yeah. And like you said, at least Corman did yeah. give oh, you the money oh. for it, you know. Roger, you know, he didn't pay much, but he was so honest, he would always pay off. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. right. He'd That's pay awesome. off on points, which a lot of studios didn't do. Mm -hmm. Right, wow. right. That's great. That's yeah. awesome. Um, now, as the 80s went on, you did you continued to work on a lot of genre films. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got you, typecast just like actors. Yeah. <laughs> um, if, if someone had no flesh on their face or was holding a sword, <laughs> they'd call me. <laughs> and, 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 and in the case of Skeletor and Masters of the Universe, it was two for one. That's yeah. Right. Oh, okay. That's, right. that's kind of a good thing. Now, though, see, right? It's all the stuff that you love. Now, this is a, yeah. this is yeah. a big deal, the whole Masters of the Universe. Stuff. And yeah. Canon production. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Canon film. Because this is really a, it was like a toy first before the movie. Kind of right. Thing. Yes, right, right. definitely. So how did you, I mean, was it easy for you to like do the designs for these or? Well, originally I was hired to storyboard the film. Okay. And uh, the director and I, Gary Goddard, we hit it off right away. Mm -hmm. We spoke the same language. He's a huge collector of Jack Kirby's work. Mm -hmm. Nice. And so we had all these things in common. And so we had a shorthand between us. He would look at something and say, uh, Kirby it up a little bit. And I know exactly what he's talking about. Really? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So we hit it off great. His production designer, uh, Jeff, he and Gary did not see eye to eye. Mm -hmm. And uh, the relationship was getting worse and worse. And then uh, one day, G Gary, he's one of the best pitchmen in the business. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he is a superb guy doing dog and pony shows. Mm -hmm. And he was doing one for all the Mattel executives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And he was taking them through showing the progress on the film and saving the best for last, the art department, where they're finally going to see all these incredible yeah. mm -hmm. visuals and stuff. Mm -hmm. And he finishes his pitch, and man, these guys can almost taste this movie. They're so excited. They're so thrilled. And Gary turns to Jeffrey for affirmation, and Jeffrey looks up from his drawing board and says, it's not going to be too fucking awful. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. Boom, burst that balloon. Wow. So about a week or two after that, uh, Jeffrey decides to leave the film and he recommends me to take it over as production oh. designer. Now, were you hamstrung at all by the budget? Like, was it, were they kind of butting up more than they could chew? I mean, what, they were trying for a big budget. Mm -hmm. I, I always worked a budget. Mm -hmm. I, I've never gone over budget on any film or over schedule. Mm -hmm. Right. And on this film, especially because the production was so screwed up, there's no <laughs> way I could be late with anything. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. right. Well, on that film, too. The problems that that film has, it's certainly not the visual, the characters, no. the way they look. Yeah, it's, Everybody it's, looks great. It's a cool looking movie. It's not, that's not the problem. The problem <laughs> right. is the rest of it, you know? The, <laughs> you know? Well, it was, I mean, boy, talk about a Canon film. <laughs> Canon and Mattel co produced. Mm -hmm. And I think the original budget was. Thirty-five million, mm -hmm. and this was like mid '80s, so yeah, which was a, a lot of which money. Was a gigantic yeah. budget for a sure. Canon film. Sure. Yeah. My God, 
And uh, so the deal was Mattel would put up the first half and Canon would put up the second half. So Mattel put up the first half and we burned through that. And Mattel's like, okay, time for you guys to put up the second half. And Canon said, yeah, we don't think so. Oh. So Mattel had to pony up the money. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, wow. Was that sort of a plan you think they had? Or is that just the... Well, part of it was also, and we didn't know this at the time, but... Canon was going bankrupt. Yeah, they were okay. in the pro- that's okay. right. They were st- and they they were still making movies, but like trying to keep it under the- <laughs> trying to keep it all oh, keep going. It going. Don't look over like here. A, sort of like a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. But now I don't. I'm not. I can't try to remember. Was was Masters of the Universe a hit though? Or well, here's it? the weird thing. No. no. First weekend it did okay. Right. Second weekend usually in almost every film. First weekend there's a drop off. Right. Right. Second weekend did way better than the first really? weekend. Really? Really? Third weekend did way better than the second weekend. Huh. Fourth weekend did way better than the third weekend. I'm thinking, my God, we've got this word of mouth hit. And suddenly it's pulled from all the theaters because Canon went bankrupt. Oh, my oh, gosh. Is that right? Wow. So it had the potential so had the, to really yeah. make a lot of money. Right. Wow. But it wow. got pulled. My thing with that movie, too, was the fact that in the cartoons and mm-hmm. in the toys, mm-hmm. it all takes place in this sort of fantasy realm. Yeah. Right, mm-hmm. right. With its own rules. We couldn't that's... afford the fantasy world. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Another there dimension, you right. That's, that's, that's why it took place on Earth. Yeah, yeah. Right. But, but, right. but when you bring them to Earth, it then you... But yeah. then you got fish out of water stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Could have yeah. worked. Potentially. <laughs> <All right. laughs> uh, well, so, okay, I want to just list off some of these other movies. Wait, that I, got, I got one oh, really oh, weird. This will probably oh, bring, every, bring everybody is it, down. Is it, is it weird? <laughs> no, no, I love it. That means I love it. If it's weirder <laughs> than Jaja Gabor, we'll see. <laughs> okay, in Masters of the Universe, there's a fast food place that Courtney Cox works at called right. Robbie's Ribs and Chicken. It was named after Robbie, my art director. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we took an existing fast food place. Not, not actually not too far from here. And I designed plugs to cover up the original signage. So, mm-hmm. we, so it would be Robbie's and okay. everything. Right. The front parking lot of that place, that's where Rodney King got beaten. Oh, my um, gosh. Wow. <laughs> so it's famous for more than one thing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. What are the odds? Yeah. Who yeah. knew? Yeah. 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 Um, okay, so some of the other movies that yes. you worked on in the 80s and into mm-hmm. the 90s, House... Yeah. The, oh, House. The Hitcher. Yeah. The Hitcher. The Hitcher. Love the Toby Hitcher. Hooper's yeah. Invaders from Mars. Well, Le- Leviathan. Fun. Yeah. Men in Black. Yeah. Uh, Predator 2. Uh, the first Predator. Not any of the others. Oh, pre- okay. Pre- yeah. Predator, Predator 1. Predator 1. <laughs> uh, but some other. Uh, wow. Or, or Predator also. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where's that? Where's that sequel? <laughs> but uh, the one, one film that was like an ill fitted project that never happened uh, that you've talked about that we are so fascinated by too. Yeah. And we kind of briefly touched on this in the Films That Never Were episode. And that was in the early 80s. Steve Miner, right. director, and he had done <clears throat> Friday the 13th. Part two and three, three and three D, two and three, yep. and the three D was a big hit. Huge yeah. hit, uh, right? And that was and the, solidified Jason. Yes, with the and hockey with the hockey mask. mask. And this yes. was like a kind of minor renaissance of three D at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He had Jaws three D, mm-hmm. and so Steve Miner, off of the success of Friday the Thirteenth Part Three, wanted to do a three D Godzilla film. Right, Godzilla and, King of the Monsters in three D. And you, you were brought on, and you and as well as many other notable effects people were brought to this. T- tell us about this because sure. this, is, this is fascinating to me. Originally, I was hired by Steve Miner to do a big presentation painting for the film. And uh, when he was visiting the studio, he saw I'd storyboarded First Blood and, and some other pictures. And what studio was this for? Oh, he he pitched it to every single studio on the planet. Oh, okay, mm-hmm. so he was just going around independently pitching. He just wanted, it he wanted a visual to go with the pitch. Right. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and so there was effects in almost every scene in the script. Mm-hmm. Great script by Fred Decker, who who did Monster Squad. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and so he began to hire me to do storyboards of some of the effects scenes. And at about that time, uh, Mentor Hubner was visiting my studio. Mentor Hubner was considered the world's greatest storyboard artist mm-hmm. living at that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he storyboarded uh, North by Northwest for Hitchcock. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Fantastic wow. guy. So Mentor and I were friends. He was also married to Louise Hubner, who's the official witch of Los Angeles at that time. <laughs> oh. Who knew there was such a title, but we there know. was. <laughs> wow. Okay. Know that. So Mentor's looking at my storyboards. Now these, you know, I did all kinds of storyboards. Sometimes people just want thumbnails. Sometimes they want more elaborate stuff. Right. Or, well, I was doing big elaborate panels, sort of like eight by ten, 
mm-hmm. very large for storyboards. And I was drawing all the stuff that was in each panel. And Mentor's looking at this. He said, Bill, you're designing the motion picture. You, you could shoot from these boards. He says, you should ask uh, Steve about being the production designer. Mm-hmm. So it hadn't occurred to me, but I thought, what the hell? So I, next time I saw Steve, I put the question to him. He said, let me do some checking. And so he called all the people I'd worked with, and they all recommended that it was a good idea. Mm-hmm. So he made me the production designer. So then I started to get to hire all the great people in the business that I knew. I, I got Rick Baker to start building a gigantic robotic Godzilla head. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Dave Stevens, the creator of The Rocketeer, and sure. Doug Wildey, the creator of Johnny Quest. They were oh doing God. storyboards for me. Dave, Dave Allen? Was it uh, David Allen was going to do the stop motion animation. Oh my I remember uh, being so excited when I heard this information. There was a picture, there was a, a, your drawing mm-hmm. of Godzilla. Uh, it was like it, in Starlog it, or something? It was in Star, or? Starlog, and, and uh, it was just one picture. And I remember right. being so excited, and I waited, and <laughs> waited, <laughs> and waited. I was like, when, <laughs> when, is, when is this damn Godzilla film coming yeah. out? Yeah. They know how to create tension, dramatic tension, you know? <laughs> yeah. And was the, was the concept of the script, it was like going to be Godzilla in America? Was that the so, idea? It's Godzilla in America in San Francisco, and he starts by destroying the Golden Gate Bridge, wow. and he ends up dying on Alcatraz. Oh, oh wow. wow. It's just Jeez. incredibly poetic, beautiful, all from seen from the point of view of a, a 13-year-old kid's eyes. Oh, wow. How, how big was Godzilla, by the way, in, in your... Uh, well, I know, but <laughs> when, when you, he's attacking the Golden Gate Bridge, is it, is it like when he stands, is he in the ocean and he towers over the tower, or is he much smaller, he's, was he much smaller than he's that? He's almost you know? as tall as the bridge, but he, he's ripping out all the cables okay. and stuff. Gotcha. Right. Go I'm sorry, what was the plan for the design of the creature to be more or less faithful to what Toho had done? I wanted it to be... When you watch the Toho Godzilla movie, you always know it's a guy in a suit. Yeah, sure. Pretty pretty obvious. I wanted that to not be obvious. I didn't want a guy in a suit. That's why we wanted to do stop-motion animation. Right. But I also wanted it to be Godzilla. So I designed a a sort of dinosaur-esque or Tyrannosaurus-esque Godzilla and and pretty much capable the face, but made it more realistic, a little less cartoony. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it was immediately recognizable as Godzilla, but it was also immediately recognizable that there's not a guy in a suit in this thing. Yeah, there was right. a leg right. thing. You yeah. had to think Some about the Godzilla's like. legs. Right. You were a leg yeah, man. Yeah, they weren't kind those of a big, thing. fat, yeah. stumpy things. Right. They were, so <clears throat> this was shopped around, but was the ultimate reason why it wasn't picked up because it was just considered too expensive? Or That's exactly it. Four really expensive films had just bombed, Heaven's Gate being one of them. Oh, so okay. all the studios were going like, big budget film? No way. Right, mm-hmm. right. And so it was the right project, but at the wrong time. Oh, man. It was sad. Yeah. He would go up to the chain of command, and when he finally, he get yes, 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 and finally get to the top, and they say no. But and it, then he'd have to start all over again. But see, it was wow. more than, I mean, th- Sean, if you think about it, it's, it's more than just, okay, stop motion, Godzilla, you know, an explosion, special effects. I mean, they wanted to do it in 3D. So yeah, that's definitely the, I mean, you're shooting with two cameras. Which, so, right. And stop motion animation has never been done. It's it never been done. Yeah, Except really. Except Viewmasters. Yeah, exactly. But oh, the, yeah, that's right. like one frame. It's not right. like, you know, actual right. motion. Yeah. I mean, just the thought of it just is mind boggling, yeah. you know. Yeah. But yeah. the yeah. other thing that, that was an impediment is that Steve wanted to direct. Right. And at the time, he'd only directed the two Friday the 13th movies. Right. Not exactly. And so what the guy, for... this guy doesn't have the chops to direct something right. that, like this. Well, it turned out he did have the chops because right. subsequently he directed some terrific yeah, films. Yeah. I mean, all kinds of movies. Right. Yeah. It's just so sad to me when that movie doesn't get greenlit and yet then you've got the TriStar <laughs> one. <laughs> right. Like, right. Uh, which I didn't necessarily yeah. completely hate that design. I mean, I understood, you know, make it almost like an iguana. Yeah. But to me, that version of Godzilla didn't bring out to me Godzilla. Right. Yeah, but right. you also have yeah. to remember, too, Matt, that at that time, when that came out in 98, the technology had changed drastically. Sure. I mean, it changed yeah, you could do CGI. Into, and... In 1990, 92, 93, you know, when the whole CGI stuff came around, there, you know, Everyone's thinking, heck, we can make this, you know, fantasy creature come to life using computers. Hey. And it's funny. We've said this before, too, in other episodes. But it's interesting that stop motion feels more real 
Whereas CGI kind of looks more real. Exactly. It feels, it feels yeah, more real fake. because you feel the animator inside that creature. Yes. You can yeah. feel Willis O'Brien, who used to be a boxer, fighting that T-Rex. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, can, really. I can feel Ray Harryhausen in each of his creatures. Yeah. There's something really. that he... I can feel and see almost the sweat. But yeah, yeah you, can, <laughs> you can see the physical nature of this little puppet that looks so huge. Yeah. I mean, look, look... I, in Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, when you see that Cyclops come out of the cave, to me, he was monstrous. He was yeah. huge. Shocking. Yeah. Not like a little yeah. puppet. No, it's scary. And, and it is. It is scary. And such a great design and the motion and the movement and the and eye. And the sound. Look. Yes. I mean, the I mean, roar. It's just, it's yeah, just yeah. so great. And it's you're right. Sometimes with the, the, the CGI, I think people lose sight of that. And yeah. when you look at a movie like Jason the Argonauts, when you have... Mm all the skeletons, the skeleton army yeah. fighting. Now, if you did that now, I think your mind, your eyes would just kind of just gloss over the whole thing because it would just be this sea of CGI. Okay, when you yeah. watch that movie, you are in it. You are pulled in and there's a visceral quality to that scene that just keeps you connected to every little swipe of a sword mm -hmm. and anybody that goes down. I mean, those... Skeletons were real to me, and yeah. it's almost—it's almost like you know, just instinctively, that there's all this painstaking work that took yes. months and years, right? Right, and it you just feel the back pain, yeah, and it commands your attention. <laughs> Now, well, you you worked on this for a while. This two Godzilla. years, so it's like oh two years, years just solid on this Godzilla project yeah. that never happened. Yeah. And are there are there any existing things yeah. left from that? Like any models? Or, got where's that Godzilla head that Rick Baker was working on? That's <laughs> what I want to know. Did you yeah. did you bring it with you? <laughs> <laughs> and here it is. Hey, no, it's a, seriously. So I, I've I've got the Godzilla that was sculpted by Steve Cherkis, uh, and and it's got it's articulated. It's got the, <gasps> oh, the wow. yeah, it's got the seal armature inside. Oh, my Ooh. God. Oh. Oh, but it's it's foam rubber, so it's rotting away. Oh, yeah. right. Oh, right. Man, you got to put it in an airtight, you know, <laughs> restore case. And restore it? You know, yeah, yeah Maybe, that's what you need to know. do. Yeah. Universal called me about doing a Van Helsing TV show prior to the release of the feature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? And so that was the first time I found out about the feature. I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Van Helsing. <laughs> yeah. Back to <laughs> Frankenstein and Wolfman. Fantastic. Well, my kids saw it first, and they came home. I said, oh, how was it, guys? And they go, Dad, you're not, not going to like it. it. It looks like a video game. Oh, yeah. It, it yeah. does. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. And we were just, before the show, we were talking about the, you know, the whole dark universe, shared Love. universe thing that Universal tried to do with, you know, with oh. the mummy and kicking that off. Tom Cruise. Talk, talk about a mm. waste of an incredibly valuable franchise. Yeah. I mean, they have, they have all the classic monsters and they and don't know what in. to do with them. Yeah. Yeah. How can that be? Oh, it's terrible. So um, one of the films that uh, we all love here, uh, classic uh, <laughs> classic 80s horror film, horror comedy that works so well, is Return of the Living Dead. Return of the Living Dead. 1985. Great every single with. time. No matter how many times you watch that movie, yeah. it's always great. always great. I never get tired of it. Never. Never. And no, you, there's no way to get tired. And if you do get tired of it, <laughs> something is wrong. Yes. In your wiring, yeah. you need help. Yeah. You need to call someone. Yes. You don't have to call us, but you need to call someone. Now, what, your official title was a production designer? Pro production designer. Okay, so uh, for those out there who don't know what a production designer is, I'm in charge of everything you see on the screen except for the performances of the actors. So wow. I'm in charge of all the special effects, all the sets, all the set decoration, all the props. Basically, if you see it on the screen, uh, it's under my domain. Right. I typically will have 1,250 people working under me. Doing wow. all oh, my the God. So, like, the tar man was your design? So, that was the first creature I designed for the oh film. We have really? it right here. Yeah. <laughs> Dan O'Bannon, the writer-director, mm -hmm. said, Bill, you know how films have principal characters? I said, yeah. He says, our film's going to have principal zombies. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I don't want the zombies to look like George Romero zombies. I want them right. to be really distinctive. And, and really EC Comics interesting. kind of. Interesting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan and I share the, that EC Comics bond, uh -huh. Tales from the Crypt and all that stuff. Now, how did, he, how did you become involved? Did he reach out to you for well, this? Well, when I was working on Conan, uh, Ron Cobb, he very gregarious guy. He and his wife would throw a lot of parties. And Dan O'Bannon was one of his closest friends. And... I'd always be at the party, and Dan would always be at the party, and mm -hmm. I would often use those parties as a way to get feedback for whatever projects I was working on. Mm -hmm. So I'd bring them to the party and just get people's opinions. 
And I noticed that Dan would, would always look especially carefully and closely at whatever I brought. And I brought mm-hmm. in a comic book cover I'd done for Alien Worlds. <gasps> oh, love that oh, one. I love that oh. one. Oh. A spaceman sinking beneath oh, the yes, ground. Yeah. I know that one. I know oh, yes. love that. Little oh. creatures coming to get him. Yeah, oh, I yeah. love that one. And Dan was fascinated by that. And I didn't know why until later. He was considering me to be the production designer for Return of the Living Dead, but he wasn't sure if I could do high-tech stuff. Mm-hmm. And that astronaut suit, he said, when I saw that guy, I thought, Stout can do high-tech. This yes. is great. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when he became the director of the film, he gave the producer a very short list of who he wanted as production designer. Number one was Bernie Wrightson. Mm-hmm. Number two yeah. was me. Mm-hmm. Well, the producer's no dummy. He immediately checked and saw that Bernie didn't have any film credits, but I ha- already had a string of film credits. Right, right. So even though Bernie was Dan's first choice, the producer called me and cut a deal with me and then lied to Dan and said, well, uh, Bernie passed on the project, but I got just out. <laughs> 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 Now we've had a guest on our show, Brian Peck. Oh yeah, who, who was who yeah. was in it? And, and now he Brian told, saved all those props and yeah, 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 yeah. He's, yeah, he's, yeah, he's a very yeah. good archivist. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. Or, or or thief, however you want to say. <laughs> well, but, yeah. but but was interesting that he, apples and oranges. He, he loved working on this so much that I mean he played a specific character, mm-hmm. but then when it wasn't time for his scene, you know, okay, we're not using you today he would come down anyway There's and a, hang, hang out and yeah. he was asked he told us he was asked to oh can you do a zombie can you do this and so he's all over the film oh yeah yeah then the other guy who was like that was james Caron. Oh, right. He's my favorite actor to work with. Was, oh my god, he, he seemed like just, he must have been so fun. Ah, oh, he was the best, and and he would show up on days that he wasn't working just mm-hmm. to keep the cast pumped up. Really, That's awesome. he was so what fantastic a class act. that way. What a well, incredible was... guy! He brought Jason Robards to the set. <laughs> wow! Yeah. Wow! <laughs> they should have that go. <laughs> yeah. not, not Josh Agabor. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, now, she's everywhere. Was it a was it a pretty smooth production? Was it no, a tight it was schedule? A brutal. I, 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 I had heard it was a little tough. It was the hardest film I've ever made. Really? Oh yeah. yeah. Really? Now why? Uh, two people in key power positions who were giving me. I was being ground up in the middle because each one was giving me the opposite direction of what to do. Okay. Mm, right. No, and, that's got to be and, maddening. And those people were. <laughs> <laughs> but no, did, did um. This is not sixty did, minutes. <laughs> did, uh, did Dan O'Bannon like not have that much control? Like, did he have to answer to the studio a lot, or was it more? You know, well, Dan's a very clever guy. He, he yes, he did have to answer to the studio, and uh, there was all kinds of conspiring to take the film away from him. Mm-hmm. And really, and. I was sort of Dan's inside guy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People, for some reason, trusted me and would share the secrets of the uh, overthrow and all this stuff. And oh I go, back, Dan, I say, okay, this is what they're going to do. This is what they're planning. Wow. And then he would come up with a counter move. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So I'm just curious, was one of the problems, or was it always understood from the very beginning, the humor element of the film? No, that was never a problem. Really? Okay. okay. Yeah. And boy, that really taught me so much about how valuable great actors are. Because I read the script and it was funny. But uh, I was also at the table reads when they had cast oh, the film. Nice. And it was four times as funny because these actors knew how to turn lines that, in my mind, just sat there, turned them into hysterically like, funny cl- things. Like and, and James. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't name it after me. I mean, yeah. come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Well, Brian told us he was all excited thinking that he was going to be in a, like a George Romero type film. And he, yeah. he didn't realize the comedy was there. Yeah. He was actually surprised. But he has, he has grown to love it, well, though. What's so oh, yeah. brilliant about that movie is that I mean, so there are horror comedies, right. but that's a perfect example of the horror being horrific, really scary, really right, scary, right. And, and even when they and they, the comedy being really funny. Yeah, like even when the even when the zombies say something funny, like yeah. "send more cops," yeah, is hysterical. <laughs> yeah. But also, right. I'm also looking at this horrible creature speaking into a microphone, and it's still terrifying. Still terrifying because yeah. you know. Human cops are going to show up, and they're going to be and they're going to be annihilated. (laughs) And and then the tar man. And we can just go to the tar man. The tar man as a design, because talk about something that is completely out of the world. I have never seen anything. Never seen anything like that. You've got the melting skin, Mm -hmm. the tar, and then the movement of that that suit actor. I give at least fifty percent of the credit to the tar man to Alan Troutman, the guy who is in the suit. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why on every film I've worked on, if, if there's a guy in a suit creature, I say. 
do not hire a stuntman. It has to be an actor. An actor right, is going right. to bring that thing to life. Yeah. And Alan can move as though his bones aren't connected. He was just fantastic <laughs> yeah. as the tour man. Yeah. yeah that's Incredible. It, it becomes this truly an otherworldly yeah. character. That is not just a guy walking kind of blankly in a mall. That is a, a, something right, I've never right. seen before. Yeah. And then you've got the special effects of just that jaw coming open. Yeah. <laughs> Blew my mind. Yeah, and then the half corpse. Oh, <laughs> oh my God. Oh. So good. Brian was so helpful with that because, you know, when the corpse is is cut in half, it's actually, it's Brian doing everything because <laughs> it's, he has to create the illusion that the zombie is pulling him through this broken opening yeah. in, in the wall. Right, yeah. right. And stuff, but it's just Brian doing all that stuff and pretending. Yes, it's, no, it's, it's fantastic. It's so, good. so they get so they get the half corpse and they put her on the gurney and they tie her down. Now that was Brian was operating the head and doing the temp track for the voice. Uh, Tony Gardner, who had built the half corpse, he was operating the hands and arms, and I was underneath the gurney. Uh, making the spine flop around the spinal fluid. Ooh, spinal oh. fluid. Oh. That was to me. That was the touch thing. <laughs> <laughs> spinal fluid. <laughs> spinal fluid. That's good. Oh and then, of course, one of my all-time favorites, which I would love to see some sort of figure of or something. Especially, it would have to actually talk. Is the half dog. Oh yeah, oh, split yeah. dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Split, 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 split dog. dog. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah. Right. Split dog. I would love to have that. Every time you hit it, it would go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, no, that's such a yeah. great. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, not, a classic. I, I mean, I know you guys know. You know, comedy horror for me. You know, not really into it, but there's something about the whole world of Return to Living Dead that, for some reason, it just clicked. You know, yeah, yeah, and I just bought it from the very beginning. Well, and we've we've talked about horror comedy too when it comes to that. There's a certain reality to bringing comedy to horror because when something happens in your regular world that is just so fantastic mm -hmm. that a lot of people their natural inclination is to use humor as sort of like a deflecting yeah. element to just live through this moment. Yeah. You know, it's like gallows humor. And there's so many moments in that movie where everybody is just <laughs> trying to just hold on and they can't because it just keeps getting worse and worse. You know, you got two guys who think that they're alive, but they turn out to be dead yeah. and, they, and they realize it. And yeah. it's like, where do you go from there? I right, love right. that scene where the paramedics are frantically checking these guys. Yeah. Yes. And he's going, yeah, yeah. take his temperature. Yeah. I said, what do you got? 70 degrees. <laughs> it's room temperature. Room temperature, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean no post? <laughs> so good. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Now, you talk about you know actors as opposed to stuntmen playing monsters. Yes. You got to work on Pan's Labyrinth. Yes. Oh. And we, we've had Doug Jones on the show, too. Fantastic um, actor. And tell us yeah. about oh, that experience. The best, best guy in the suit monster. He's just, he's incredible. Now, what, what kind of design work did you do for that? So, thing? I, I I did the initial designs for for the pan creature, the fawn. Mm -hmm. right. oh. uh, designed uh, the main set where the film takes place, mm -hmm. and designed oh some creatures that were actually cut from the film. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, yeah, that's was that a good experience? I mean, that oh, it was a like... great experience. I I've, I wish that I could have spent longer on the film. Uh, it was a very low budget film, and Guillermo couldn't afford more than a week of my time. But in that week, right. I tried to design a whole bunch of stuff. Right, but I. I I was willing to go to Spain and make it with him. Oh my God. He seems That's to be amazing. like the sweetest guy ever. Well, Guillermo and I have a lot of friends in common, and all the friends kept saying the same thing. You have got to get together with Guillermo. You two guys are like two peas in a pod. You're really going to hit it off. And we just kept missing each other like mm -hmm. ships in the night. And then uh, Frank Darabont, who directed Shawshank Redemption, mm -hmm. he used to throw a big dinner at the best restaurant in San Diego for all his favorite artists and sometimes a few film directors during Comic-Con. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. And so he sat me opposite Guillermo. <laughs> nice. And so the next day, Guillermo came by the booth. He bought a couple of paintings and he said, uh, Would you mind delivering these to my home? I have something I'd like to talk to you about. Oh, so, nice. Sure. Great. Sure. <laughs> so he came over. First, he gave me a tour of that unbelievable <sighs> collection. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. My God. Man. And then uh, he started to talk about Pan's Labyrinth. He wanted me to work on Pan's Labyrinth. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of our conversation, the phone rang, and he, he took it. And I, I heard his end of it, which was, oh, yes. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very, very honored. 
but I'm afraid I'm going to have to pass. I need to make my little Spanish film. He <laughs> <laughs> hung up. I go, yeah, what was all that about? He said, oh, that was Warner Brothers. They just offered me Harry Potter. Oh, no. Oh, really? oh my God. My opinion of him just shot oh, yeah. way up. The integrity wow. of this guy. <clears throat> right. Blowing off the Harry Potter franchise to make his little Spanish film. And, talk and about, he was right. Too. Yes, yeah. yeah. I was yeah, just going to yeah, say, like, yeah. he's that, talk about the correct mm. business decision yes. because Pan's Labyrinth has, like, Blossom beyond its initial release. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, oh my, my gosh. God. That's uh, I went to the. There was a couple <clears throat> advanced premiere things for The Shape of Water. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we watched the film, and then everybody comes out at the end. Right. And <laughs> Guillermo comes out, and the first thing he says is, I know what you're thinking. What is Michael Moore doing here? <laughs> <laughs> He's hilarious. Just a funny He's guy. Funny. And nobody can curse like him. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so now, tell us about some of the publications you've done, too, because you've done so many books. I know you have a new book that just came out, mm -hmm. but, I mean, you, you used to be like the go-to guy for dinosaur art. I mean, you're just kind of, you're the dinosaur guy. Right, and that, that sort of happened by accident uh my friend don glute had written a book called the dinosaur dictionary mm -hmm. I have and, book. and there have been so many new dinosaurs discovered after the publication of that book that he thought well, it's time to revise the book and his goal was to have at least one visual image per listing mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i agreed to do four dinosaurs for him and mm -hmm. that turned into 44 <laughs> <laughs> nice. and while i was doing the dinosaurs i thought you know this may be the only picture of this animal the public ever gets to see so it had better be accurate so i started consulting with the paleontologist who had found that dinosaur <gasps> wow. this is before email so we had to do snail mail i would xerox yeah. My pencil sketches, send them to him. Wow. He'd write notes on them, send them back. And we'd go back and forth until we were both happy. And so that was a, a fun project. And at that time, I also joined the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology so I could keep updated on all my dinosaur info. Mm -hmm. And then Byron Price, my regular publisher, was visiting from New York. And he said, Bill, if you could do your own book on anything, what would you do? And I thought he was just being conversational. And I really was at a loss. And, and he saw all these dinosaur dictionary pictures around my studio. He said, would you like to do one on dinosaurs? I go, well, that'd be fun. Forgot <laughs> about it. Two months later, Byron calls me up. We got our book deal. Bantam wants to do your dinosaur book. Wow. Suddenly I had this gigantic project dropped in my lap. 80 color paintings, oh 50 gosh. black and white illustrations. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> And the, the stars aligned, and Life Magazine did, I think, an eight- or 12-page full-color spread on my book. Wow. And oh uh, it became this huge seller. And it was the very first dinosaur book to collect all the information, all the new information about dinosaurs that wasn't getting to the public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That they weren't slow. They weren't stupid. They were fast. Right, right. Uh, some of them had feathers. They took care of their young. Mm -hmm. Now, what was the name of this book? It's called The Dinosaurs, A Fantastic New View of a Lost Era. Awesome. And you did a children's book? Did a children's book after that. 1984 won the Children's Choice Award for 1984 called The Little Blue Brontosaurus. And that oh. was kind of the inspiration for Land Before Time. Inspiration right? is a very kind way of <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Have you ever mm. thought of maybe dabbling in actual paleontology? Like uh, going out there and digging? Get, Getting out there? I, that's that's a, one of the ways I relax. I love to go on dinosaur digs and just relax. I, I, you've, yeah, you've my traveled. My first one-man show was traveling around the world, and uh, it ended up uh, one time at the Royal Tyrell Museum up in Canada. Really? And they called me up. They said, we want to fly you out for the opening. If you want, we can fly you out a few days earlier, and you can go on a dinosaur dig in Dinosaur Provincial Park. I go, put me up. Wow. Yes, wow. I'll do it. I'll take it. That's yes. great. That's so awesome. So I, I get there. It was like a, like a... It seemed like a two-hour drive from the museum to get to the dinosaur park. And the paleontologist is taking me to the spot where the dig is. And I look down. I see I am stepping on dinosaur bones. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm, I'm ruining science here. You know, this is terrible. He goes, oh, that's just junk. What do you see what we got? Junk. Oh, my gosh. And he takes me to the spot where the people are working. And he holds out his arms at uh, 90 degrees to each other. And he says, now imagine two city blocks within this space. We think we have 20 to 30 
thousand dinosaur skeletons here. Wow. wow. And he hands me a whisk broom. He says, get to work. <laughs> and I got oh a whisk broom. Now I'm used to dinosaur digs. It's, yeah, yeah. it's hard. The rock is yeah, hard. Isn't you shovel, have a pick and a shovel? Oh, my God. It's, it's really tedious work. But I start brushing away sand, and in the first half hour, I find three Centrosaurus skulls. Oh, my God. I'm like, oh, my God. Now, oh, wait a minute. I am the new guy. They salted this. You know, They put these in and then covered up with sand. Yeah, and yeah. No. It really was wow, just like that. And I could just take a whisk broom and find dinosaurs all day long just by brushing away sand. Wow. That's like a, a kid's dream. A <laughs> yeah. Christmas a dream. dream. Yeah. yeah. Oh it's unbelievable. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, so tell us about, too, your, you did this trip to Antarctica, which yeah. kind of you know, had a big influence on your kind life Kind of cold, well. though. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that all started with... I was the, the biggest movie nut you'd never want to meet. I would see <laughs> everything. I go to film festivals. I go to movie marathons where you enter the theater Friday night and don't come out till Sunday night. And you're watching 24 yeah. hours a day, movies, 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 movies. Right. And uh, so there was a new movie coming out. Don't recall what it was, but I was real excited. I was walking up the street. And a friend of mine spotted me from his car, and he pulled over and said, Hey, Bill, what are you doing? I said, Oh, man, I'm going to go see this new movie. And he looked at me like I was some kind of schmuck. He said, Really? Movie? Man, two hours alone in the dark. He said, You could be having your own adventures instead of watching somebody else's. And that just flipped a switch on me. From that moment on, every year I would schedule an adventure around the world. Uh, first place I went to was the Galapagos Islands and Machu Picchu in Peru. Ooh. Wow. And so... I've got these beautiful photography books on Antarctica, and all the great, greatest photographers in the world said the same thing. Try as they could, they couldn't capture the color of what was down there because of the limitations of the chemicals and emulsions. And I thought, <clears throat> well, I don't have that problem. Anything I see, I can put down on a paper. This sounds like a great place to go. <laughs> and then I found out that the Antarctic Treaty, which protects Antarctica, was due to expire in 1991. And this was 1989. I thought, I better get down there because if they don't resign the treaty, I may never get a chance to see mm -hmm. this place. That treaty is uh, remarkable. It was created by President Eisenhower. Uh, we had something called the International Geophysical Year around 1957-58. It was a year of international cooperation of all the scientists of the world. And it was so successful that Eisenhower did not want to see that spirit die. So he created the Antarctic Treaty, which states that no country owns Antarctica. All wildlife is protected. There is no commercial exploitation of the continent allowed, no mining, no oil drilling. All information is shared. Even at the height of the Cold War, the Soviets could come to any of our stations, look at what we were doing, and we could do the same with them. So it was this little oasis of sanity in the world. Mm -hmm. 39 nations all getting along just great. And... Uh, I'm just glad that that has continued to be the case. <laughs> well, I, ironically, it was the United States that was not going to re-sign the treaty. Oh, imagine because that. Because yes. the first President Bush is a Texas oil man. He wanted to open up for oil drilling. Of course. So I thought, well, the American public's probably not going to raise any protest against that because they have no idea what Antarctica is like. I mean, before I went down, my friends would say, why do you want to go down there? It's just a bunch of snow and ice. Or they'd say, oh, you're going to paint down there? Bring a lot of white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, that's good. Shit. Yeah. It's like, why so, go there? Is there, is there so, a Chili's there? Or? <laughs> <laughs> so I went down on a, a luxurious cruise ship with uh, the L.A. Zoo, and I was not prepared for how spectacular this place was. Most spectacular place I've ever seen in my life. And the color. One night I was on the deck of the ship. It was midnight. It was still light enough for me to paint. I was doing pastel landscapes. And the sky went from a lime green to an apricot orange. The sea was mint green. There were blue-violet icebergs in the distance. And to the right of the ship, there was an iceberg. That, below the surface of the water, there was a lemon-yellow light emanating. Wow. Gosh. Just so bizarre. And I thought, you know, I have to do something to preserve this for my kids and my grandkids. <clears throat> and I thought, I know. I'll put together a one-man show showing the diversity of, of the beautiful wildlife that is down there. And then I thought, and to make sure that every kid brings their parents to see the show, I'm going to make half the show prehistoric Antarctica with dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, yeah. So as soon as I got back to L.A., I flew to Columbus, Ohio, to the Bird Polar Research Center and got a crash course in Antarctic paleontology. And I uh, did my first five paintings, and I contacted uh, Dr. Craig Black, who is the director of the Natural History Museum of L.A. County. And he came over, looked at the paintings. He said, you got your show, and we will travel it for you. 
Wow. So that was my first huge one-man show. It was 45 oil paintings. Oh, my gosh. And so it, tra- it was all over? I mean, what kind of... It, it went... Yeah, when all of the country, uh, Michelle Gorbachev personally requested that it come to Moscow. Wow. Oh, gosh. So I've, I've got that, that letter at home. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we have a letter from him, too, saying it's yeah. <laughs> for our podcast. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. Putin really loves Monster Party, I'm telling you. I, I don't That's remember amazing, that, that so, like, letter. Like, so so up until that point, I subscribed to what I called the Pinball School of Career Planning, which is boing, 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 <laughs> bouncing all over the place. Right. And, right. I, and I think part of that is short attention span and but when i was doing the antarctic paintings for the first time in my life i didn't have that feeling it was the feeling of i think you could do this the rest of your life right and i i didn't want to stop after the 45 were finished so i thought i'll set another goal of a book on the history of life in antarctica and make it 100 oil paintings i'm about 20 away from it being finished oh my God. but i think that'll be my most important book wow and so that's how I got to Antarctica. Yes. And, and after that, I found out that there was a grant that I applied for and I received called the, uh, it's from the National Science Foundation. It's called the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program Grant. And every year they pick one or two artists, writers, and photographers to go down to Antarctica. And I, I got the grant. I got to live in Antarctica uh, for four months. I got to do seven wow. scuba dives under the ice. Oh, camp out you went under the ice? Yeah. It's the best diving in the entire world. On a great day, the Great Barrier Reef or the Bahamas, the visibility is 120 feet. Mm. Antarctica is 1,200 feet. It's clearer than the air in this room. You're wow. kidding. God. It feels like you're flying through thick air. Just, but very I mean, cold air. Very cold air. <laughs> water's 28 degrees because it's salt water, so it can go below how can, 32. How can you do that? You, well, I mean, you've got a, you've got a, like a thick so you wear suit a or rubbery right? I, For suit? each dive, I would wear... Uh, Extra heavyweight expedition underwear like long johns. Right, right, right. Over right. that, a thermalite jumpsuit like an astronaut jumpsuit. Yeah. And over that, my dry suit. I got, okay. Dry suit, okay. okay. So actually, wow. you're, you're dying to get in the water because you're on the surface. You're heating up with all those layers. <laughs> wow. And, Gosh, uh, that's amazing. It was funny. I was sitting on the edge, and I said, you know, I, I thought I was going to do a deep dive my first dive. And they said, well, I, I said, I can see the bottoms right there. They said, how deep do you think that is? I go, that's 20 feet. They go, that's 100 feet. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. That is incredible. Did oh, you wow. see any like like ten thing? foot tall sponges? A sponge? The the intense cold makes creatures tend towards gigantism. So oh, I saw wow. sponges that were ten feet tall. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were uh, purple scallops the size of dinner plates. <laughs> I love scallops. Oh, <laughs> and, and then there were all these, they looked like deflated hoses. They were these worms that I was warned in advance, do not touch them because they secrete a slime over their body that's acidic. It'll eat right through your gloves. Oh, no. Oh. And Alien. then before I did my first dive, I also researched all the leopard seal attacks on divers in Antarctica. And at that time, there had been 84. Wow. They, oh, I didn't know they attacked divers. Oh, I, yeah. I thought they were like they're really friendly. smart animals. Yeah. Really smart. The way they uh, will kill penguins, That's their main food is penguins and seals. Yeah. And uh, divers. They will, <laughs> you know, they will lurk behind an iceberg where huh. there's a whole lot of penguins gathered at the shore, and the mm-hmm. penguins are terrified to be the first one in. Right. And it'll just wait until finally one goes in. Oh, it didn't get eaten. Another goat. And then they all jump in. Then he goes, and he, he, he'll grab a penguin, and he'll flick it so hard, he'll flick it out of its own skin. Oh. And, and then he'll eat the carcass. Oh, my oh. God. But the skin is the tastiest part. <laughs> I know. I know. A little butter, a little... Yeah, yeah. Wow. Only here on Monster Party. <laughs> you didn't know that. No, no, I did not know so that. So do these seals, do they attack you for no reason? Just because you're in the it's, water, it's, you're in their territory? You look They're tasty. either confusing you for a seal. There was a... The year after I was there, there was a woman who was kneeling down at the shore. So from underwater, I guess she was the right size of a penguin, and it just leaped out of the water and grabbed her and pulled her in. Okay. And then uh, there's one seal that would, he would wait underneath the Zodiac boats. Those are the inflatable boats we went out on. Okay. And the scientists would come down to the boats. Oh, great, no leopard seals today. That's fantastic. They get in the boat, and they take off, and they go to where they're going. Well, the seal is swimming directly underneath their Jesus. boat. <laughs> and then as soon as they went in the water, he attacked them. Oh, my wow. God. Smart so bastards. So one, one of the things we do is we carry seal sticks with us because they won't come any closer than the nearest thing that they can see. Okay. And so if you've got a 10-foot pole, they're not going to come any closer than 10 feet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. And, and if you see a leopard seal, you immediately swim back-to-back with your dive buddy okay. so that at least one pair of eyes is always on that seal. 
Mm. So and, and then you have to swim away from the boat because if you swim to the boat, the seal will sink the boat and your oh, driver of the boat will go down with it. Yeah, and then it's God. smorgasbord. Yeah. But, wow. uh, so you did, head for the shore. Is there any mm. other ways of like... This is going to sound very naive, but making friends with them in any way, like giving the yeah, you know, like, give hey, a sar- I've, sardine I've, or something. No, I, I've got a penguin. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is, when they're on the ice, uh, like on an iceberg or on the shore, yeah, they're fine. They'll never attack. Yeah, no, they're just fine. Huh? Very mellow, but they know their element in the water. Yeah, yeah. wow, completely different that's fascinating. Wow. I also got to camp out in the dry valleys. There are these huge expanses, these big deserts in Antarctica that are completely snow and ice free. And and they have freshwater lakes in them. And wow, it sounds like sounds like the the Amicus film is like the land of time for God. Oh right, you know? yeah, right. Like, yeah. The, the, the awa- jungle oasis in the middle of the Antarctic. But Doug McClure well, is out there, yeah. you know, <laughs> fighting yeah. a pterodactyl or something. Yeah, it wow. sort of felt like that because I took a I I went out to one of the dry valleys and I it was warm enough I could sleep outside my sleeping bag, wow. and I was at a place called Camp Hoare, H O A R E, and. The scientists there decided, hey, let's take a hike to the next cabin. That was uh, nine miles away. Hmm. So we did this 18-mile round trip, and every eighth of a mile, the terrain would change dramatically. Suddenly, I'm looking at a – it was all sand, and then it looked like a giant had dropped huge marbles made out of sandstone boulders, perfectly round spheres dotting the landscape. Wow. The eighth of a mile later – you look like you're in the middle of a garden that has been petrified. All the flowers have been turned to stone. Wow. Gosh, that's Now, amazing. eighth of a mile later, there's the colossal chunks of granite that look like Henry Marr sculptures, and some of them carved by the wind so thin that you can see light through the granite. Wow. And it was just like that all the way that's to amazing. the... We have to do a show from yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, yeah. I was going to say, uh, you, you know, there have been films... Made about killer bunnies, you know, uh, killer ants. That's true. <laughs> but you know what? The killer seal, you know, no, that's true. true. No, we haven't had that. I mean, there's yeah. Happy yeah. Feet, which has like <laughs> seals that look different. <laughs> right. But I mean, this is completely different. So we different. call it Unhappy Feet. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's nice. uh, or, uh, or, uh, there's or, some. Or once he had feet. <laughs> <laughs> Foot, footless. <laughs> footless. Hey, there we go. Footless. footless. <laughs> Sean shoots, he scores. Oh, that's, nice. that's a nice one, Sean. I like that. Oh that was good. Yeah, that's, I enjoyed that's that. In, that's oh, that's incredible. Now, are there, are there some places that like are on your bucket list? The place yeah, I like, I haven't oh. gone yet that I really want to go to. Madagascar. Okay. Hmm? Big Island off the coast of Africa. I thought you were going to say Van Nuys, but that's fine. <laughs> 90% of the animals on that island are found nowhere else in the world. Ooh, okay. And unfortunately, it used to be entirely covered in forest. Now there's one little tiny strip left. Oh, man. They've burned all of those forests for charcoal. For charcoal. And, and with that, all those animals are gone. Part of it was also arrogance of them saying to the United States, who is trying to help you know you could save this uh-huh. this is really valuable this land this natural wild land that you have and their attitudes you can't tell us what to do mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right so so but i want to see it before it's completely gone. yeah 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 totally so when when are we going <laughs> <laughs> now when you go do you, do you like set up a little chair and take out an easel or something and you start painting or something or, or is it more like i'm, I'm just gonna go have my adventure no no i uh when i went to antarctica the first time, I think I, I did 130 field studies and shot 12,000 slides. Wow. wow. And so the field studies are what I use as the basis for my paintings, mm-hmm. my oil paintings later when I get back. And the photographs are for like beak details or the skin of the feet details, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Right. Wow. How many times have you been? So uh, three times. Wow. That's incredible. Any interest in the northern side, the Arctic? Too damp and cold. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't Ant- know. Antarctica is the driest, is drier than the Sahara. It's the driest place on earth. It's the windiest place on earth. It's the coldest place on earth. Wow. It's, it's, where a they, cold. it's where they were. It's where they were. It's where they were uh, training the astronauts uh, for the Mars mission. Wow. Oh wow, jeez. And not where they discovered the thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, right. and that's a film I. So want to do at the mountains is madness. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes. And that's, wasn't there that's talk that Guillermo weren't wants you to supposed do to do that? That's right. That's yeah. Right. Guillermo was going to do that. Guillermo's dying to do that, and he told me he wants me, Wayne Barlow, and Mike Mignola to design it. Please. 
Yes. Right now. Oh. I'm a Lovecraft fanatic. Oh, yeah. Well, here's yeah. the thing. Isn't he... And it's the a, only novel yeah, that he yeah, wrote. Yeah. Full, yeah. Full novel. That's right. Yeah. So that's Guillermo's right. on fire. So he you know, he just won you know, what, the one best director. He's got know, the juice now that yes. he, could, he could pull yes, that Yes, he off. could do it now. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm sure he, he could say to some executive, you know, I want to make this film. It's going to make a millions and millions of dollars. And they go, okay. you got to yeah. know what you're talking about. A lot so. of Are you doing that. tattoo? <laughs> <laughs> no. A lot of them said okay as long as it's not an R. Oh. oh. I was like, wait a minute. Oh. Lovecraft novel is going to be. It's got to be an R. It's yeah. always yeah. going to be an R. Yeah. Oh yeah. The Shape of Water was R. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Maybe things are trying to change a little bit. By the way, I do really, really love your Cthulhu Tiki Stein. Oh, thank you. That's a thank that's you. a work of. I did that for genius. Mondo, and I had so much fun with yeah. that. Yeah. Combining two of my favorite things Tiki it's, Mugs and Cthulhu. I'm a broken record, but Lovecraft, talk about the most underrated. Unexploited in a lot of ways. Untapped. Yeah. Untapped. Yeah. For, yeah. Especially in the c- cinematic yeah. media. I mean, for being, especially something that is I would say, public domain. I would say untapped or, un, or successfully. Unsuccessfully, yes. yes. Because, yeah, there have been several Lovecraft movies, but most of them aren't very good. Well, and I would say even the ones that are good, I enjoy. But, you know, like Reanimator is great. Yeah. I love that movie. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's, it's comedic yeah, and right. it's loosely mm-hmm. based on. And there are a couple others. I also love uh, Stuart Gordon's Day Gone. Yeah, I think it's Gone. great. Now, to me, that's a terrific Lovecraft. That's a, that's a great movie. I like that one. Yeah. yeah. And it sort of combines two Lovecrafts. Yes, yes, right. Shadow over Innsmouth and Day Gone. Yeah. yeah. But, and uh, it's got the longest chase sequence I think I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> that goes for like 45 minutes. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And it's scary. It's one of those yeah. moments, too, where you feel like you're the one being pursued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's but, a good one. Uh, but yeah, it's true. Considering it's, that all this stuff is public domain but, now. But, but now, today, I think now with effects technology, you could do the scope of Lovecraft successfully. You know, I think you could do it with, it, yes, it would have to be CGI, I think. Yeah, a lot yeah, of it, no, but it's definitely you technologically could do possible. Combination. But it wouldn't, that's what I'm saying, it yeah. would not have to be CGI. It could be CGI assisted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's so many opportunities Enhanced. for practical effects. Oh, yeah. Because like, yeah. I always love the Dunwich Horror. There's uh-huh. so many creepy things in that story. Yeah. And then one of my favorite things ever is Wilbur Waitley. And mm-hmm. to see that done in practical effects by a really great director like Guillermo del Toro or whoever who had the chops right, right. that wanted to take on the project, God, let's go, let's do it. But see, I think Guillermo, he, he's a fan of practical effects, but he's also yes. not afraid to let mix the two mediums, like yeah. a, a little <laughs> sure. CGI, he, to accentuate this character, to, to mod- you know, make this character... He understands yeah. restraint, yes, yeah. too. Yes, yeah. Yeah. right, right. On a related subject, one of the films I did ad work on was John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, wow. oh it was one of our favorites. First, they sent me the screenplay, mm-hmm. and I read the screenplay. That is the scariest screenplay I've ever read <laughs> in my life. Mm-hmm. It was at least four times scarier than the film. Oh, it's Bill, really? Bill, really? Bill really? I love the film. And it seemed like Carpenter sort of got seduced by Rob Bottin's creatures, and I wish that he had just shot that script just the way it was. Now, was it more because of like the character relationships, like the tension, the paranoia aspect just of it? absolutely terrifying. It, it got to the point where I think I was halfway through I said, I'm not sure I can finish this. Wow. And this this was, gets um, any scarier. This was Bill Lancaster, Bert's son, who had written yeah. The Bad News Bears. Really? And he the, wrote that script? Yeah. Oh, my God. And those were like the only wow. two feature scripts I think he wrote. Wow. Bad wow. News Bears, if Man. you read the original script, it is <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Four times scarier than the film. Oh, my <laughs> God. Tatum O'Neill, completely. She, she had no idea what she was doing in that film. But getting back to the thing, I, I, sure. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I still love all of the I, creatures. I love, and, I love Carpenter's and The Thing, too. Look, and when I saw it for the first time, I had no... I, I got to a point where I didn't trust the film because yeah. I didn't know... You know mm-hmm. what things were going to be happening. Right. You know what I mean. We all know what all these creatures look like now. It's famous, but the first time I saw it, I mean, I had no idea. And when the you know guys on the <laughs> yeah. on the table and <laughs> hey, <laughs> clear <laughs> sh- yeah. ah! chest mean, opening no, up with fangs no. that yeah. chop off your arms. <laughs> yeah. From that point on, you go okay. <laughs> okay, it, I, it I, could I, come I, from yeah. anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. I didn't. Tr- I trust it. I mean, and through the whole film, and it could look like. You exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right, right. Yeah, your best so friends. through the whole film, it's it's like when you come across a film where you just don't trust it. You don't know if something's going to jump out or pop out or change or something like that. Right, you right. just don't know. 
And you really have to give it to John Carpenter for being able to put together that little dance of, is it you or is it you? Because that could get yes. very tiresome right, in a right. lesser director's hands and a lesser writer's hands right. where it was so taught that you got to a moment where, okay, that little crisis was done and then you get a little breather mm. and then it happens again. And God, I yeah. mean, that's that's another one that I can watch like Return of the Living Dead. Every say, time I watch it, it's yeah, it, fantastic. It holds up so well. You yeah. can watch oh, yeah. it over and over and yeah. over again. I totally. like it. You must know, have seen it at least a dozen times. You know, and so what kind of things did you do on the thing? Design work? Oh, uh, did you see the Books of Blood, Art of the Thing? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, the, my... Pieces I did in there are in that book. Okay, okay. okay. So, oh, that was the other thing. Uh, I said, okay, I've read the script. What do you want me to do? They said, well, you know, create the poster. I go, what do the creatures look like? (laughs) Oh, we can't show you that. (laughs) You go, what are you talking about? Can you give me photos? No, can't give you photos. And that's why the Drew Struzan poster is a guy oh, with yeah. arms oh, on a Right, yeah. right. Yeah. yes, because yeah. Because they wouldn't let Drew have any of that stuff either. Sure, right, uh, so, yeah. So what I did was, I thought, okay, so I did a, I did two paintings. Uh, one painting, uh, each painting was a, a guy in a parka, mm-hmm. and it was in the dark, and you could just barely make out his features, and one guy has got tentacles coming out of his mouth. Wow. And the other guy has no skin. It, it's just the human muscles of the face. Mm-hmm. So well, perfect, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's there awesome. you go. it works. Now, I want to touch a little bit on, in addition to all the other mediums, you also worked a lot on theme parks, yeah, and you worked on Disney Imagineering and Islands of Adventure. How did mm-hmm. that come about? That was so strange because the, the guy who hired me hired me not knowing that I'd done any film work, <laughs> he hired me because he loved my bootleg record album covers. <laughs> <laughs> Great, nice. hey. which by the way, you designed do you design the rhino for rhino records? Yeah, the original yes. rhino, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's an awesome image. I gotta t- tell you about that. Uh, Harold Bronson and uh, Richard Foos were the two founders of Rhino Records, and they used to be clerks at a shop in Westwood called Rhino Records. Mm-hmm. And one day they said, wouldn't it be cool if we put out our own record? <laughs> and so they got Wild Man Fisher, the street character who was, he was a hustler. He, he was very aggressive. He goes, sing a song for a dime. And if you paid him a dime, he'd make up a song for you on the spot. <laughs> so they got Wild Man in the back of Rhino Records. And on the spot, he composed uh, Come to Rhino Records song. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Harold called me up. He said, we need a logo for our, our first record. Uh, it's called Rhino Records. Can you do something? So I did Rocky Rhino. Mm-hmm. And oh, that appeared on classic. the very first yeah. Rhino record. To their amazement, it sold out. Wow. So, they, well, let's do another one. So the second record they did was Led Zeppelin's Whole Lot of Love Played on Kazoos. <laughs> <laughs> oh that sold out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that that was the seeds of what became the best re-release company in the world. Oh, wow. And, and yeah, they, they, oh, had, they had a niche oh. there for a while. That was and now, so right, good. Now Richard is head of uh, Shout Factory. Oh. Oh, okay. there you go. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Full circle. Yeah. In yeah. Sense. Oh. That's awesome. Yeah. So in the mid-1970s, it was a lot looser. You could go to a rock concert, bring your own Sony tape recorder, and tape the whole show if you wanted. <laughs> yeah, right. You could get up to the stage and take pictures of the band. Right. So a lot of people were doing that. And a lot of people who would tape the shows would then go back and press up 100 vinyl copies of, of the concert and sell them on the street in Hollywood, sell them on the street corner. Yeah, I have some of those. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so I was at a Led Zeppelin concert. It was a great concert, and I saw lots of people taping it, so I knew there was going to be a bootleg coming out of it. And when it came out, I was in Record Paradise on Hollywood Boulevard, my favorite record store. And I looked at the album, and I went, oh, the band deserves better than this. This cover sucks. It's awful. I wish someone would get me to do these covers. And a guy in the shop tapped me on the shoulder. He goes, you want to do bootleg record album covers? <laughs> I said, well, yeah. I goes, meet me at Selma and Las Palmas. <laughs> Friday night, 6 o'clock. Be alone. Wow. So, whoa. So, 6 o'clock rolls around. Selma and Las Palmas was a really seedy part of Hollywood. Right, right. I'm waiting there, and this coupe drives up with smoked windows. And one of the windows on the passenger side comes down a crack. And a piece of paper comes out. I take it, and it says, Rolling Stones Winter Tour, and there's a list of songs. And the voice inside says, see you in two weeks. Same time, same place. Are you kidding me? 
So God. I did my first cover. It was sort of a tribute to Robert Crumb's Cheap Thrills. It, oh, I like the yeah. idea of having an illustration for every song and having the band on the cover as well. Mm-hmm. And so I did that, and two weeks later I go there, and the car shows up, and the window goes down a crack, and I put the cover in like I'm mailing a letter. <laughs> <laughs> and a $50, emerges, $50 bill emerges in its place. Wow. Eventually the bootleggers got so that they could trust me. The name of the company was Trademark of Quality Records. So I kept pushing them to do higher and higher quality stuff. Mm-hmm. At first, the album covers were printed on a sheet of paper that was slipped in between the shrink wrap and the boards holding the mm. LP. Interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then I got them to print it on directly on the mm-hmm. cover. And then I got them to do color covers mm-hmm. and stuff. Oh my gosh. You know, so I ended up doing 45 covers, and that's what I'm known for in the UK. They don't know my dinosaur stuff. They don't know, oh my but they, they know my bootleg record album covers. Whoa. That is amazing. <laughs> so this guy, Tim Onosco from Madison, Wisconsin, got hired by Walt Disney Imagineering to uh, work on a huge new project of theirs called Disney Island. They had this problem in that in uh, Walt Disney World in Florida, after the parks were closed, people would leave the property and go into Orlando and go to the nightclubs and restaurants and yeah. stuff. So mm-hmm. he said, design us something that will keep all those people on property. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So he called me up, asked if I was interested, and I was. It sounded really intriguing. I was like learning new stuff. Plus, I love earn-while-you-learn situations. It sure. actually pained me to learn how to design theme parks. I'm right. not going to pass that up. So I was designing uh, restaurants, uh, nightclubs. It was uh, self-contained property and stuff and we came up with a i worked on it for i must have been over a year and that's where i first met jim steinmeier we were hired the same day great magician and we did what was described later as the most elaborate presentation disney has ever seen we had lasers and smoke and (laughs) all kinds of stuff and it was interesting We, we kept showing it and showing it and showing it and one time we showed it to a whole group of architects and there was several people who were sort of threatened by it, and they, they vowed to kill this project. Really? Uh, we got all invited out to Orlando, uh, and we were told there that uh, this project was too expensive. We exceeded our budget. I said, you never gave us a budget. You give me a budget, I'll work to a budget. Mm-hmm. But you didn't give us a budget. Mm-hmm. Right. And they said, well, besides that, if we built it, no one would ever come. And well, I that's said, well, really I beg to differ, yeah. but, you know, it's your money. So uh, a couple years later, I got uh, called by Steven Spielberg to design a a new venture. He said, it's a joint venture between DreamWorks, Universal Studios, and Sega Games called uh, Sega Gameworks, later shortened to just Gameworks. And uh, I said, Steven, you got the wrong guy. I hate video games. (laughs) I really hate video game arcades. They're even worse. It's a black box where nobody talks to anybody. He said, that's exactly why I'm calling you. I said, I want you to design a place that you would love to go to, that your wife would love to go to, that girls would love to go to. We've already got the boy market. They're going to go no matter what it looks like. Right, right. And he said, I see society fragmenting. A lot of people have stopped going to the movies. They just stay home and watch things on their home screens and stuff. Right. He says, design me a place that will bring family and friends together. I thought, oh, I like that. Mm-hmm. So I remember first going to a game works. I'm like, they have a bar here. This is yeah, cool. I can yeah. drink and good have drinks, snacks good while food, playing video games. games. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. It's and talk about something that's been copied. Well, yeah. So when I started GameWorks, the guy who hired me, he, he actually is my, my neighbor, John Snotty. He created the THX sound system for George Lucas. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Okay. John found out that I had never seen City Walk, and he's like, mm-hmm. "What?" Right. <laughs> oh, wait, right. Stop everything. I'm taking you there right now. We're going to walk up the hill. I want to show you this place because I want to see your face. I go, what are you talking about? <laughs> so we go up there and I look and I go, holy shit. They built Disney Island here. This is, <laughs> this is my entire concept. <gasps> Jesus. Oh, wow. And it's packed. Mm-hmm. People love it mm-hmm. just the way I thought they would. This is amazing. Mm-hmm. Well, it turned out that one of the architects I presented it to, his name was John Jurdy. And after they killed the project, Jerdy took it to Universal. Oh, my gosh. And so I was in the L.A. Times. They had this big article on Jerdy, and they were just raving and raving about how groundbreaking and special and brilliant the City Walk was. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a letter to the Times. Look, here's what happened. I gave them the history, and I said, I basically designed it. and, Mm -hmm. And it started this war in the L.A. Times. Really? 
people writing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I found out that at Walt Disney Imagineering, they were taking my letters and they were blowing them up wall size for everybody to read. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And, and wow. it had, they had a split reaction at Disney. Half the people thought that I should not be taking credit for it. Only Walt Disney should take credit for Disney stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, Walt's dead. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. my checks. And the other half was like, thank God we finally got the credit we deserve for right. creating this place. Right, right. Wow, that's amazing. And Jerdy sent me a really nice Christmas card that year. Because <laughs> he, he got tons of publicity from this. That's true. That's right, great, right, yeah. Right. Just the, the initial template of Disneyland. Yeah. If you like that, wouldn't you want more of that? You know, you're going to go into a restaurant. Wouldn't you want to see the restaurant be kind of bigger than life and right, have right, an entire an street that's like that? Right. Like the, the idea that someone would go, ah, that's not going to work. What? Yeah. And then you don't like joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, right, right. You there are you anti-joy. Yeah. It's amazing. I put myself through art school working at Disneyland. I, I worked in New Orleans Square painting watercolor portraits. Wow. I was wow. doing 80 portraits a day. Oh, my God. That wow. was you? Yeah. <laughs> How much did you get to keep? Uh, buck 75, I would say. It adds up. <laughs> it does. Yeah. I was making more money than my dad. Wow. wow. Boom. Yeah, yeah wow. it was amazing. I was able to live for at least uh, three quarters of the year on that money from the summer. Did you ever walk into your dad's place with the big thing of money and go... <laughs> <laughs> Suck it up, Dad. Yes, Dad. <laughs> well, so you've kind of mastered so many of these mediums in so many ways. Is there any like film project or TV project or anything that you kind of would like to do or wish you had done? Like, I'd like to do a western. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of my dreams was to design a children's television show, and I, I did that. I designed mm-hmm. a show called Lily's Light, which just turned out exquisitely beautiful, beautiful show. I would love to make At the Mountains of Madness. I'd love to make Steve Meyer's Godzilla project. Mm-hmm. What I've got lined up is I've I've got this huge new book out. It's uh, it spans my fifty year career as a working artist called uh, Fantastic Worlds: The Art of William Stout. Fantastic but Worlds: The Art of William Stout <laughs> available on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so. And it's 12 chapters. Each chapter is on a different aspect of my career. So there's a chapter on Antarctica. There's a chapter on dinosaurs. The chapter on film design. There's a chapter on theme park design and Mm. so on. That's just the tip of the iceberg. What I want to do now is do a a book on each of those different chapters separately on its own. Right, right. Just more in-depth and more elaborate. Right. You've written... Screenplays. You, mm-hmm. I, you wrote an episode of the animated Godzilla cartoon. Yeah, that was fun. Um, have you thought about directing at all? Is that something you want to get into? Or I've been offered two projects to direct. Uh, one is uh, you might know this guy, Tim Lucas, a oh, video yeah. watchdog. Yes, yeah. He Love wants me to direct a film on the life of Maxfield Parrish. Oh, cool! Oh, wow. and, yeah, uh, and we would co-write that. Nice. Yeah, and then uh, the other project is a project called Vilkova. Ironically, both of these projects I was approached to direct, I uh, was approached in Louisville, Kentucky, not L.A. or Hollywood, but Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky. <laughs> wow. And there are these uh, writer-producer team in Louisville have written this uh, script called Vilkova, and she is the daughter of Lilith, Adam's first wife, ah, and right. she's a vampire. Mm-hmm. And she falls in love with Vlad Tepes. Oh, oh, wow. wow. That is murdered, and he becomes reincarnated later. Now it's World War Two and he's reincarn- reincarnated as American GI. So this involves uh, wow. George Patton and Adolf Hitler. Oh my gosh! And, uh, oh, I'm Vlad, there. Vlad Plus the vampires. Yeah. And yeah. Demons. Oh, that perfect. Awesome. And I didn't Great. know it, but George Patton was a huge believer in the occult and collector. Really? He well, I know because you know, like, like Hitler's famous for that. You know, but like yeah. I didn't know that Patton was. Yeah. Patton claimed to have the spear that pierced Christ when he was spear of destiny. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. wow. Where do you get that from? I don't know. Flea market. Uh, (laughs) Wow, that's fascinating. So actually today I was working on a cover for a Vilkova graphic novel. My advice to them was, okay, we've we've got the script. I want you to turn it into a novel, and then we're going to do a graphic novel as well so that we tie up all the rights ourselves. Right, Um, right. You know, like how we're talking about posters and how that's changed. You know, you've been in the business for a long time. You've, mm -hmm. You've been in all these different aspects of it, like... How different are things now as far like Completely. as far as getting in the business and just like being able to you know, express yourself artistically? I mean, how, how has it changed? For the better or for worse? Or? Much, much worse. 
Much, much worse. Uh, really Great. Good. <laughs> yeah. Here, the most common question I get when I'm on a film is, Bill, you're a really nice guy. What are you doing working in the film business? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. And that speaks volumes. Yeah. Really, right, right. it does. And most of the nice people I know have gotten out of motion pictures. Yeah, it's, it's right. rough out there. Yeah. Part of the problem is films are so expensive now. Mm-hmm. If a studio has yeah. four bombs in a row, that can sink the studio. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Whereas that's true. during the Roger Corman Canada days, you know, <laughs> Return of the Living Dead, the budget was a million and a half. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If the film survived. tanked, yeah. so what? Right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, even now, like a so called low budget movie really isn't a low budget anymore. It's, it's no. yeah, yeah, it is such a big risk. You're right. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I love now about this renaissance of horror right. is that there's a lot of these yeah. up and coming yeah. filmmakers who do something on a very low budget. And a lot of times practical, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, and practical effects are kind of yeah. coming back, I think, yeah. to a point. And, yeah, because they're more affordable than the CG right. stuff. Yeah. yeah, which people are finally realizing. Right, yeah. Yeah, and one of the things that's really helped young filmmakers is the fact you don't need to buy film stock anymore. <laughs> yes. That's that true. was the huge yes. expense of yeah. true. Kill you. movies. And that was why in the 70s you, you couldn't finance your own films. There's no way you couldn't afford the film stock if you're a young filmmaker. Right. And so you needed a Roger Corman or, or Canon film films but when, now you can shoot everything digital yeah right. oh yeah uh i studied film mm-hmm. in college obviously larry did as well and mm-hmm. so did james i don't know what you were doing <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but i remember trying to buy film stock 16 millimeter film stock and yeah. it was so expensive did you yeah. buy ends no what i would buy is i would buy vnf Video news film. Oh. And so it would have a magnetic stripe on it. It would be what the, uh, you know, the news crews would go out with their cameras. And it was reversal, Mm -hmm. but at least you could buy a lot of it for a pretty cheap price. And a lot of it you would get, like, it would be stuff that they didn't want anymore. So it was even cheaper than what it was. Right. And so, you know, you could, you know, again, it was reversal. So you didn't get that kind of quality if you were using negative or something like that. But at least you could make a movie. And especially if you were making something weird and atmospheric. Right. You know, sometimes that could be a plus. But yeah, that film stock would kill you every time. And lab fees. Oh, yeah, lab fees. Plus you'd have to get the negative cut. Right, you yeah. Know, A-B it. rolling. That's right. Larry yeah. and I were talking yeah. about A-B rolling. Yeah. Can you imagine? Like that experience alone, because A-B rolling is like to make a film look like it didn't have any splices in it. Right. So you had to do right. this, these two separate strips of film that had alternating a scene from the film and then black where the <laughs> right. other shot was. Mm-hmm. And then you would combine them in the lab. And you had to do this by hand yeah. with glue. <laughs> with glue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I and remember white doing, gloves. Yeah. Yep, I, 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 and it was maddening. And if you messed up at all, mm-hmm. you'd lose a frame and you'd have to fix everything else. It was just, it was archaic. Yeah. But Steven Soderbergh just shot an entire feature film on his iPhone. And it looks fantastic. Mm-hmm. And it's a great film. Oh, yeah. It's called uh, Unsane. I've heard that that's good. Yeah, yeah. I've heard that's good. It is yeah. such a white knuckle thriller. Wow. Oh, wow. Man. Okay. So yeah. Claire Foy. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm in. Good for him. Awesome. So I know that, you know, you've done all these wonderful things. I love theme parks as much as the rest of these yeah. people in <laughs> yeah. the podcast. Theme parks, Co-host. Is, theme parks Co- it's like designing sets that aren't going to be turned down. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sure, that's true. How about a monster party ride? Yeah. How about yeah. that? Well, you know what? Uh, when I was at WDI, Walt Disney Imagineering, they hired me to design an entire second Disneyland for Tokyo. Ooh, what? what happened was Tokyo called them up. They said, you know, we don't have a Matterhorn. We want a Matterhorn. Mm-hmm. So in Disney's mind, it, it became not we want a Matterhorn. We want something with a mountain. So they called me, Bill, design a theme park based around a mountain. <laughs> so I made the mountain sort of pyramidal. So if you looked at it from one side, it's the Hollywood Hills with the Hollywood sign. Uh-huh. If you look at the other side, it's Bald Mountain. Oh. Fantastic. If you look at the other side, it's Mount Fuji. Oh. Wow. That's so awesome. the uh, Hollywood sign, that, that had the MGM Disney Studio Tours. But Bald Mountain had Monster Land. Ooh. Oh. Nice. That's and great. And Fuji, a whole Godzilla experience. Oh. oh. I don't know how many times we have... Pulled out our hair, yeah. going like, "Why isn't there a Godzilla to- theme park? Godzilla yeah. theme park? Yeah. It's even natural. natural. Yeah, it get totally. Tons it's in of a characters. It's in like- a movie. Isn't there like a Godzilla <laughs> yeah. theme park? Yeah. 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 Right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I designed a ride that uh, you're in an amphibious vehicle, 
And it starts out, you go underwater and you're seeing like the, the birth of Godzilla and all this stuff. And then eventually you come out of the water. And now you're going through Tokyo and you're getting glimpses of Godzilla until you turn a corner and there he is, the full size head. Oh, oh my gosh. You remember Universal Studios when they had the King Kong oh, experience? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I thought that. that was so great. Yeah. yeah. Banana and the, breath. The, yeah. yeah. The, the, the fact that they even tore that down is. It's, yeah, I know, oh, that it was brings cool. tears to my eyes. It yeah. brings tears to my eyes. I, I loved. Mm. People said, oh, it's just some. Giant, you know, mechanical ape. It looked great. I yeah, loved it. It was, awesome. it was fantastic. Yeah. It looked I like you were in it. King Kong. Yes, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It was our giant ape. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. right. right. I mean, I mean, I don't know if you guys have been on the updated version of the Kong ride. Yeah, it's, and I, it's, mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's the, like it's, every it's, other ride now. It's like it's a CGI. I mean, it's cool. It's an experience. It's yeah, cool. The tram goes through basically a giant um, movie theater. Yeah, that, it's like that's a 360 very long. thing. Yeah. And, and so it's projected on both sides and you have to wear the 3D glasses and, you know, the tram moves around as if King Kong or the Tyrannosaurus Rexes what? are. And it's just not a big physical it's not furry creature yeah. that yeah. I can see. That's you what know? I like about the Harry Potter ride. Oh, because the Harry, the Harry Potter. Potter ride does a really great job of combining both. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. you got a lot of that uh, animatronic, yes. you know, magic. Mm -hmm. Like the dragon mm -hmm. and the weird what's the, what are they called rays or something the the, the dementor, ghost looking the dementors the, that, okay yeah and, they're, and they're, the spiders yeah and the giant spiders, spiders yeah. coming Ooh. at you have you ever been on that ride no it's oh, a great you love ride it. you love it's it. a great love ride it. it's so it's exciting it really yeah. is exciting i think it's amazing bill you your career is just mind-boggling you've done so much and you've worked in so many areas i'm and i'm just thrilled that you were able to come tonight and and Tell us a bit about your career. Well, thanks. I, I feel really, really lucky, mm -hmm. really lucky to have had the life that I've had, met the people that I've met, and worked with the people I've worked with. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was a little kid watching Seventh Voyage of Sinbad, I would have called you a liar if you told me that someday you would not only grow up and become friends with Ray Harryhausen, but you would work with him. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Like, what a dream that was. Yes. Yeah, totally. Incredible. And you're going to be uh, at the next Monster Palooza. Yes, in next Pasadena. Monster, Monster Palooza. Palooza. Oh, yes. Yes. Monster Pasadena. show in the world. It yes. is. Now, we were very close to you the last Monster Palooza. Yeah. Our I hope we table, weren't too loud for you. Because the person next to us yeah. requested not to be next to us. <laughs> yeah. Because we had body painters yeah, and, you know. Oh, was, yeah. I mean, we should have swapped. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. It could have been a party. Like, yeah. we thought we were helping them by bringing... Yeah, know, but... It was a yeah. bacchanal. But, right. uh, but, you know, we were thrilled to have you stop by our booth okay. last time. Hopefully, yeah. you can do that again. If you take yeah. the time to come on by, we'll chat a little bit, maybe have have a, a little little cocktail there yeah, too. A little libation. Yeah. And honestly, we are the lucky ones to have you. Yeah, thank you so showing much. Showing up for our show. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. You have I mean truly amazing career that is still going strong and, and your book, your new book looks amazing. Oh, and uh, yeah, I, I just look it's forward huge. to more stuff. If you, you if you don't like the book, you can use it as a doorstop. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But oh, it's an fun. it's an Functional amazing in many ways. Yeah, it's an amazing <laughs> book. Uh, to our listeners, again, you get to see all the different styles that, that Bill has has worked on and it's just stunning. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic worlds, the art of William Stout. Over three hundred pages, over five hundred images. Awesome. Wow. Check it out. Well, William, thank you so much for being with us. Yes, yeah. thank you. Give a toast you. to yes. a the toast art to of William Stout. William Stout. Yeah. 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 Woo Time for listener shout out. Shout out. We have several new shout outs. One goes out to Ooh. William Fink from New York, New York. William cool. Fink. James Jenkins from San Diego. James awesome. Jenkins. And Jeffrey Birch from right here in the Valley in L.A. Jeffrey Birch from the Valley! These gentlemen are all proud owners of Monster Party swag. Yeah! yeah. They've joined the Monster Party Army. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Representing with t-shirts and caps. Cool. Thank you, you said guys. It. Thank the you for supporting. Chicks are going to be coming knocking. Oh, <laughs> yeah, my beware. God. It is going to be a pussy parade. <laughs> no, come, come on. An hey. electric pussy parade. You know, maybe, look, like maybe, they have at uh, California Adventure. Look, maybe they bought these for their significant <laughs> And others. That's true. Maybe. It could it's possible. be possible. It could possible. be a uh, you know, meat and veg parade too. All right. All right. Yeah. Well, that, thank you guys. Cool. Thank yes. you so much. Cool. Thank you. Guys, remember on our toy making show, we had Jason Lindsay, the CEO of Biff Bang Pow Toys on. Do you remember that? I do. Yes. Okay. Well, we, if you guys him. remember, we also had our Monster Party unpaid intern, Kevin Smith. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, his oh, lovely, Kevin Smith. and his lovely better half, Michelle Olivia. Do you remember? Yes. Did you well, say bitter half? <laughs> better half. <laughs> better half. Well, Kevin, Kevin and Michelle, they had started Sea Demon Vinyl Toys, and they had just come out awesome. with their most 
uh, their first beautiful yet grotesque figure called Johnny Insmith. Do you guys yeah. Remember that? Awesome. Uh, well, well, we'll get this guy's ap- yeah, after we pre- so made this great. presentation. You know, yeah. they've nearly sold out. Well, now I'm happy to announce that C Demon Vinyl has just launched their new website. Hey. What? Yeah. Go to cdemonvinyl.bigcartel. So it's S E A D E M O N V I N Y L dot. B I G C A R T E L, Big Cartel. And if you go to that website, you'll see that they're selling their second new vinyl toy called Alien Man. Alien oh. Man. Yes, and let me tell you something. This it's it's called Blair. The Alien Man, and it is oh. it is a disturbing, twisted man like disturbing figure, disturbing, <laughs> twisted man like figure, and and there will be several variations. There's going to be a glow version, several painted ones, several in solid colors, and it, I mean the Alien Man to me looks kind of looks like a like an homage a bit to like uh, careful the. the uh, <laughs> Like a movie thing, yes, that like a we movie like. thing yeah. that we yeah. like. But it's it's really grotesque. It's really cool, and uh, but it's an amazing final figure. And I, I plan to order the fleshy one. There's a fleshy one Ooh. that's really really cool. Mm. Um, but anyway, go to cdemonvinyl.bigcartel or or you could just go to cdemonvinylhq on Facebook. And these these are limited edition toys. They're only about a hundred or so. So go check them out now, or or get on their mailing list for the next weird and oh, twisted yeah. vinyl yeah. figure. And they're on Instagram. As well. Yes, they yeah. are. So again, C Demon Vinyl HQ on Facebook. Check out their new grotesque monster vinyl toy called Blair the Alien Man. And let's remind our listeners that you can find us on Facebook and YouTube and Monster Party TV. Mm-hmm. On Twitter, we are at Monster Party HQ. Instagram is also Monster Party HQ. Uh huh. Monster Party swag can be purchased from our eBay store, which is called Monster Party Store. Ooh. Easy to remember. Let's also remind our listeners that we will be at the next Monster Palooza in Pasadena no! this April. Dun, dun, dun. So come find us. Get your tickets now because they sell out. Oh, yeah. True. Buy your plane tickets. Yeah. yeah. Make sure you come stop by our booth. We'd love to meet you. Yep. We would. Yeah. I also want to give a special thanks to our sponsors at Creature Feature. Yay! Yay! Hey, and I want to tell our listeners, you've got to go to the Creature Features uh, website. That's CreatureFeatures.com. Check it out. They are having an upcoming Rod Serling Night Gallery exhibit. It's hey. awesome. Yay. And you guys have to check this out. They're actually going to have paintings from the actual TV show. Fantastic. It, and it looks amazing. So it's, it, it, This looks like like a like even bigger um, event, because they, they had one yeah. in, the, in, the, in their old store. Yes. But this one, I guess, is like... More paintings and Tom yeah. Wright, the oh original artist, is going to be there, and uh, people from the show. And wow, it's gonna, it sounds yeah. incredible! So oh, you there. have to check it out. They are going to have other events coming up. Just go to their website, creaturefeatures.com. It'll list all the information. Yeah, okay? I think it's at the Peekaboo Gallery yeah. in Altadena. Yeah, in Altadena. But uh, you go to their website, and what you can do is if they're selling tons of stuff, if you go to their website, click on their eBay store. And it'll take you directly to their store on eBay where they have all kinds of things like signed books and CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, models, statues, and all kinds of things. William all- Stout stuff? <laughs> William Stout, yes, they do. Yeah. They do. In, in fact, they have a lot of great autographed uh, CDs like uh, from composers from like Cujo, uh, Reanimator, Apocalypse Now. I mean, all kinds of signed CDs uh, from uh, the composers. It's, it's amazing. Right. So... Go to CreatureFeatures.com. Check out all the information. I think you'll be blown away. I also want to give a special thanks to Time Tunnel Toys. Time Tunnel Toys. Time Tunnel Toys. 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 Located at 1583 Meridian Avenue in San Jose, California. And Joe and Sharon have a spectacular store filled with all kinds of vintage toys, records, comic books, uh, Star Wars figures, Godzilla toys, uh, kitschy black velvet paintings, posters, and the Keep America Strong Watch Horror Films Framed Painting. Go to the website, Time Tunnel Toys. Check out all their information. It also give you a bit of information on their upcoming super toy comic and collectible show, hey, which they have hey. every four months. It's a convention filled with over 200 tables of dealers all across the country selling all kinds of vintage toys. Treasures we like. Yes. On that note, I am Matt Weinhold. I am... I'm Sean Sheridan. I'm Larry Strofe. And I'm James Gonis. Keep America strong! And pay a visit to the weird worlds of William Stout 
and beware of the aquatic wrath of the Antarctic leopard seal. <laughs> Everybody sounds great, right? Everyone's happy with their levels. So I, I am just yeah. curious. Are, we have a title for this. I uh, thought it was the Weird World. Yes, the weird, the weird worlds of William Stout. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Nice yeah. That's, to it. That's nice. almost like the nice. title of a book, right nice there. Alliteration. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. then, so then it's like when we have the title. Then we'll say, and guess who our guest is? <laughs> By oh, sure coincidence. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Huh? Yeah. 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 No, no, I'll Fred say... Travelina. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why. He does a one-man show of William Stout. It's, no, it's good. It's in But should we but... say the title first, or I should introduce him and then say... How many times have you done this show, Sean? <laughs> no. We're going, we're going to talk about... We're going to go... We have a great topic. We intro, do the topic. Intro. Right. And, and the top... I'll... We could say the topic is our guest. Yeah. The weird, the weird and you part. can, if you want, you could then start with like some credits that's and what, then go yeah, that's and say. then lead into uh, yes. If you haven't guessed it already, our yeah, topic yes. is. Right. The weird world do you want to write this down? Wings. Yeah. Do you want to write yeah. this down? Because you, you, you you're cards. you doing this. <laughs> yes, you you better yeah. get it right. I will. Okay. okay. See so this. this happens. Right. You got one what? chance. <laughs> yeah, that's it. that's it. That's it. This is all. This is going out live. Well, you mean it's our first live episode. We can we can. Have uh, bring you a beverage just to have with you on the table, just so you, you have it. If you, okay. we're not sure. trying to get you wasted, but it would help. <laughs> oh, drunk history. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We are all. Did you having... see that recent one? <laughs> no. Oh no, no, no. Would you... on Frankenstein. Is that no. right? Yeah. Oh, 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 we got to see it. it. Oh, oh really? no. Is the person really good? Evan Who... Rachel Wood plays Mary Shelley. Oh my oh. god, that's great. And the Frankenstein oh, yes, monster I... is played by Will Ferrell. Yeah, no, it's but great. You oh, are I gotta see this. Richard Richard Felcher from Mighty Boosh and all that. He's the drunk guy telling the story. Story. Yeah. Oh, oh my that's God. terrific. Yeah, it's yeah. really good. It's uh, I think uh, mm. Rick Overton, who is a guest on our show a lot, uh-huh. uh, comedian, yeah. and uh, yeah, he's going to be on one of these coming up. So really, yeah, yeah. we got we got to make that happen. Yeah. Maybe it's a new thing for Monster Party. Monster we could drunk drunk <laughs> drunk, drunk Monster Party. Yeah. Yes. yeah. You know, it's funny. There's this. You know, everyone has their their phone where you can if when you're listening to us. You can listen to us at regular speed, uh-huh. or speed and a half, or double speed. And sometimes I like listen to us at, at time and a half, you know, because I come on, guys, let's get to it, you know. But if you go to half get to speed, you, well, no, that's really what we're no, talking no, 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 about. No, here. no, 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 not. That's and not, when he goes no, 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 that means that I've I've <laughs> struck a nerve. <laughs> no, uh. that's that's that is so untrue. But that is so untrue. But what's funny is if you go to the half speed, yeah, then we're like this, and oh, it does sound like that's good. You know, and it's it's funny. Sometimes. Everyone becomes Dean Martin. Yeah. Hey, Pally. So, sometimes here's like, monster body. Yeah, that's funny. And then a kick in the head. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How'd everybody get in my room? <laughs> So I'm sure you're probably wondering. We've been doing this for over five years now. He was wondering that. I could well, tell. I, well, I'm, it was he, written all over his he's face. He's an inquisitive guy. Yes. He's sharp. Yeah. He, he's got a Nosferatu on his That is a great shirt. Awesome. by him. That's fantastic. Wait, you designed to, that yeah, shirt? Yeah. My favorite poster that I've done. I have to get oh, that. Awesome. I need one of those. Monster Party, when we're at um, Monster Palooza. Please set one aside. Large. World of Strange. World oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, he's Got not going to bring shirts. I don't Just know. Just take that off of him now. Space. It's too much space. <laughs> okay, I'm he's sorry. He's going to have his, go, look, he'll have his book. He'll have some sketch wow. things, you know. And Kill me because I no, want to buy something no, from him. No, come on. He, he's a big guy. Yes. He's a big wig. He's. Okay, I'll you know, make my own. <laughs> All right. Are we ready for this? Yes, let's, let's do it. it. Okay, let's I think do it. so. This is going to be fun. <laughs> Stop saying that. It's all about You're you. You're jinxing it. <laughs> Regardless of what you might think right now, it's okay. Be okay. <laughs> all right. Wow. Okay. Here we go. Uh, and then the table just bursts into flames. Okay. <laughs> Moment of silence. Silence. Do you and really he- think that if even if I do lisp, I'm not going to do another take? No, I think you do another take. Thank you. Because you would respect our comment. You would say. 
No, no I'm just going to, because that's what I do. I just shit through all these. No, I don't, no, no. I don't no, fix anything. No, I that's don't. not true. No, yeah. as, as a matter of fact. Take another swipe at me, Larry. No, Go no, ahead. There's no swipe. There's no swipe. I'm, I'm actually going to. Take out I'm your gonna, aquatic wrath I'm on gonna, me. I'm going to compliment you. I'm going to, when, when we had, because uh, I was listening to it just the other day of uh, William Stout on our uh, Monster oh, Blues yeah, episode. Right, yeah. And I made a comment about, oh, oh, Matt doesn't do things half ass. You know, he's very, very particular. And I no, made a true. comment that's about, true. look, when James and I, we threw up the Monster Party sign and you got there and you said, uh-uh, this has a crinkle in it. <laughs> oh. And we had this, and, and part of me wanted to go, what the? But you know what? You are just trying to make us look good. So I said, yeah. you're right, Matt. Let's get rid of that crinkle. Yeah. Some would call that anal and annoying. But <laughs> but, but, you but, but you see, but you know what you oh, did? Oh. You found the silver lining. Oh, that, 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 so that's like saying, hey, let's roll out the red carpet at the Academy Awards. Oh, there's a big crinkle in it. Someone goes, ah, just leave it there. No one's going to notice it. I, and then what happens? Julia Roberts walks by and she trips over the crinkle. Oh, back to Julia Roberts. Oh, God. Well, she'll We've be done the- everything that we can to help her. Yeah, so 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 you're the guy who would say, "Nope, you got to straighten out that red carpet." I would, I would, especially and, I would, and, and so, I do it to make you look better. And, and so, yeah, exactly, you're trying to make us look good. So I'm not going to get on your case. You know, it's like anything. You go, ah, but you know, you're right. You are right. Let us let us get fix this crinkle. <laughs> why why does being right feel so wrong? <laughs> <laughs> But I've been in awe tonight. I've been in awe. No, it's oh my god! Yeah, yeah, what a no, great, a great point. guest. Yeah, thank, thanks, thank God we had Sean here to kind of you know lead us because I'm like uh, just just talk, well, man. It, I it do, was hard man. to start. I had, yeah, I mean, I had to, yeah, well, I had to categorize it by his stuff because yeah. he like it's true. He's worked yeah. in every, yeah. every you, possible. You started weekend. off with that great intro. <laughs> I know. Yeah. 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 No, you really made up for it. Yeah, uh, yeah, you ruining did. the you first did for, half yeah, of the episode. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay, Anybody, anything else you want to get off your chest, anyone? <laughs> James? No, n- not particularly. Do we have shout-outs? All right. yes, Don't, do. do you have any uh, a new one? aquatic wrath a that you'd one? like to share? I want to recycle some old ones. Did you really? No, they're new. They're new. Because I like to be fresh. No, we're fresh. All right. Oh, Just we're go. so fresh. I mean, like crisp. You crisp. know how like, you know, when you get new carrots or something? And they're kind of watery and, you on? know, crisp when you <laughs> Okay, let's go. Yeah. Or celery. Well, celery. Wow. celery, yeah. Celery, yeah. Remind me to never slip you mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> because that will go on forever. You know, I like mush- mushrooms. Oh, no, don't but say they're, that. They're not crispy. Though. Don't say that. No, they're not. <laughs> you know, I read they something. They taste yucky. I read something about celery, by the way. And how great celery is for you. Oh, that's true, though. But it's very so good for many you. things. Yeah. And you know what? I like celery. And this thing just made me want to go. I got to go out and get some celery. Wow. Pickles. You know, that's also mm-hmm. another good thing. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pickles are actually very good for you. Wait, a dill pickle or a sweet pickle? Uh, I I think it was a dill pickle. Kate, do you like sweet pickles? I love sweet pickles. I like sweet relish. I don't like a sweet pickle necessarily. I don't hate them, but I don't. I don't prefer them. I'm not going to say hate, but I dislike greatly. It's because you're from you're from the you know where they where? make yeah, you, you know <laughs> wow. oh, sorry. the Pennsylvania you know, area, you, the, you, the, the, Pennsylvania. The, the Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania what area. Aren't you? You're, you're, you know. I mean, because they, they they have a lot of sweet relish there. Yeah, right? You're all about the malls, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the uh, hot dog on a stick, yeah. and you're all and that. the coal mines and things like yeah, that. Coal mines, you know all the sweet <laughs> pickles in the, the coal pickle mines. Coal mines, <laughs> yeah. Did you ever see the movie Mate One? <laughs> <laughs> they were all up in arms about the sweet pickles. Wow. Okay, but I I prefer a good dill pickle. I do love a good I dill like pickle. pickle. I like a crispy, crisp. Clawson. Pickle. Yes. What? What? Refrigerated. What's, I don't what's want the what commercial. Is this shit? The commercial with the um the bird of some the, sort. The Groucho Vlasic. Marx bird, Vlasic. right? Vlasic. Vlasic, Vlasic, right? Vlasic. It was like a Groucho Marx bird. Are those, those store? 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 Yeah, I don't think yeah. those are refrigerated though. The Vlasics are they? Um, because sure. it could be. No, they're it has, not. They have to be refrigerated. I'm with Matt. Yeah, yeah. I prefer a cold. Chilled. You know, I like you know, the, the worst little pick- ones, the little tiny pickles. I'm with you. I love those. I love those. Those, those are kind of like what sweet pickles, kind of. They're crunchier yeah. if you get them. Uh, yeah, I love those. Refrigerated. Yeah. What I can't stand is that big, weird, ugly pickle in the deli. That's no, I don't in the like jar. those. I don't like yeah. those either. No. no. Yeah. I mean, they're okay. They're okay, but they're not like I'd like the little pickles. It's like the like pickle pickles. that time forgot. I'm not. Yeah. 
not like, into it. Uh, yeah. It's too soft in the center. The no, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it has to be super crisp. Yeah, oh, always super oh, yeah. crunchy no. and crisp. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's starting to grow something in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, you know, like the Emir? Yes. That yeah. jelly thing that it came out of? Yes. The, oh, like, yeah. I can I see, I can see it scene. climbing into one of those pickles yeah. as a substitute. Yeah. Mm, that'd be weird. Yeah. So the point being is that your shout out is fresh and crisp like a dill pickle. <laughs> Yes. Cool. I hope so. A cool, crisp dill pickle. It better be. (laughs) That should be your rapping name, Dill Pickle. (laughs) Can you imagine me... Hey no. man, it's Dill Pickle here. <laughs> I can. Yeah, Actually, I've got I a big rap yeah. here. I can. Imagine. I don't see. That's not a rap name. I, I don't my, know. I think it could be. It, it should be like uh, Lairbot or something. Well, what about, or, the, what about yeah. there's a there was a there Mac- was there's a there I think there is still a guy named Ludacris. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah Ludacris. Yeah. Everyone yeah, knows yeah, Ludacris, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Ludacris is a that's a I think that's a silly rap name. Ludacris. Ludacris. Yeah. It's, it's ludicrous. like a, a a misspelling, mispronounced, you know. Saying ludicrous, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you you remember it though. I do. No, that's true. That's true. That's, that's true. true. Like what would my, like maybe mine would be? Hey, it's Le- Leviathan, or it's <laughs> Long John, or what? how about how about let's put your hands together for Rap Master Lair Pap or something? You know, Lair hey, Pap. I don't know. What the fuck? <laughs> I'm Pap Smear. <laughs> No, no, um, no, 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 no. Come on. Come on. No. Pap-smear. No. That's how about, not how about bad, actually. Is it? Yeah. Oh, oh well, that's maybe. more like a punk, punk rock name, though. No, yeah, I think, yeah. yeah that's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. Like, I'm just glad we could clear this up. Like though. the Vomit yeah. Pancakes. Isn't yeah, that, aren't like they a that. punk band? I like that. Is it? Yeah. Is that a real name? I think you're Mr. Punk. You should know. I am Mr. Pancakes? Punk, but I, I'm not familiar with that band. But if that is, I would listen to it. There is a band called Diarrhea Planet. See, it's actually very good. <laughs> See, that's, that's stupid. Good. I like that. Diarrhea great. Planet. I mean, come on. They even say Put your that their name to... is stupid. Okay. That's it's cool. ludicrous. But it's ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> on that note. <laughs> I am Matt. Yeah, okay. okay. All right. Let's get to this bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute. I, lo- you, I love a good wait, lull. <laughs> don't you? Wait, don't you, you have? Do just jump right in, Larry. Did you go into my spiel? No, no. I wanted to know. You have a shout out as well. I did. I did. But I thought you were going to. Is there like a. Is there like a. Oh, you want me to go into. Okay. No, 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 no. I thought you had. And we got a review from. You know, we can win an award with synchronized lulling. You don't have anything? Did someone send us. Well, that's what I was talking about. But I had the shout outs. I don't have a review. Well, I thought you were going to say, and we also got a little note well, from. We don't always have reviews, though. No. Yeah. Well, I, what gave you that idea? Well, I think we should get reviews. I'd love to get reviews. We haven't gotten a review in a while? It's been a little while. Well, to our listeners, you should, you know, <laughs> chime in. Oh, what? Well, are we Why you? is this turning into like a Sunshine Boys routine? <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't you get a review? I don't know. Why did you get a review? We should get a review. You know, you know who died last week? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> is that a joke? Well, you haven't seen the Sunshine Boys. In no, two I've years, seen. But, I've. Okay. It's a long oh, time oh, ago. Oh, right. Apparently, you're not too aware of it. No, hmm. no, I'm aware Mr. of it. Mr. Film, no, George Burns. Hello, <laughs> and, and he Walter, the, Walter he Matthau. Yes. Oscar, Oscar yeah, nominees. Right. Yeah. yeah. What? Oscar nominated? For yes, that? for that movie. Yeah. yeah. Really? Yeah. Richard George, Benjamin. Oh, okay, and originally, originally, the Walter Matthau's part was actually going to be played by Jack Benny. Did you oh, know that? Really? But guess what happened? He died? He died. Oh. <laughs> he shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Can you that. imagine what kind of film that would have been? George Burns. And- that would have been great. Yeah. 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 Jack yeah. Benny. Jack Benny. Although, yeah. yeah. Two great classic TV guys. Anyway. Yeah. It's yeah. my two cents. <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I do this? Film Corner with Larry Stroth. <laughs> okay. Here we go. <clears throat> Hello, friends. Hi there. <laughs> I'm Larry Stroth. But you can call me Pap Smear. smear. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Okay. Go. You know, I don't even think that's funny. (laughs) All right. Well, there's three of us. We have outvoted you. (laughs) Do you think that's funny? Yes. (laughs) <laughs> it's just stupid. It is. Um, it is stupid. Yeah, but it, but it's when funny, it's stupid, it's become funny. In funny. The mo- it's funny in the moment. Yeah. yeah. So the moment has passed. Go, oh, no, okay. no, they're gonna say this is stupid. Uh, okay. Well, then it is, and we're sorry, everyone. Can I? Can I? Can I do this? Shout out, please. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah, what do you now you're doing foley? <laughs> What's happening? And there's a fire. Oh no, there's a fire in the studio. <laughs> Okay, now that's funny. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Oh, so I didn't know you were now Mr. Comedy. <laughs> props are always funny. Yeah. You know, props are funny. Okay, uh, you have to go. You have to leave now. You don't like props? Uh, not necessarily. I like a good prop. I mean, I like them in moderation. Okay, here we go. So you just finished your shout out. Hey, guys, do you remember um, our toy making episode with uh, Jason Lindsay? Hold on, let me think about it. Yeah, of okay. course. Yeah, yes. he's the CEO of Biff Bang Pow Toys. That's oh, right. you guys yeah. just that? had lunch with him. That yeah, was a great episode. Well, you know, if you guys remember, we also had on our monster party. Uh, yes. We had on a show. We had our unpaid intern Kevin Smith. Oh, uh, Kevin and Smith and his lovely better half Michelle Olivier. Oh, yes. Michelle. Well, I want to let you guys know that Kevin and Michelle they created you know the Sea Demon vinyl toys. Yes, yes they did, okay. and they have just come out with another. Fuck, I got to do that again. Dill pickle. <laughs> I'm just going to continue. <laughs> Please they do. Just came out with me. Kevin and Michelle, they created Sea Demon vinyl toys, and they had come out with uh, their first beautiful yet grotose, grotesque figure called Jolly Insmith. Remember that? Yes. Remember that? Yeah. Yes. Really, really cool. Did you say Jolly Insmith? Uh, I meant Johnny Insmith. But Johnny it is Insmith. Kinda, it's but it is Jolly, Jolly too. Yes. No, that's going to look great. I've well, named mine Jolly. Well, Smith. okay, but but they nearly sold those out. But get this, get this. I'm happy to announce that Sea Demon Vinyl just launched their new website. Oh no, SeaDemonVinyl.BigCartel.com. Check them out because Sea Demon Vinyl. Sea Demon Vinyl. You're giving me notes about <laughs> fucking delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Go start over again. Just start with the website. Start with the website. I'm happy to announce that C Demon Vital. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. I looked at him and he made me laugh. I, no, it's good. No, it, you know, look. There's so it's so rare that we find joy in this world. You know, embrace it while true. we can. It is true. I mean, there's a lot of I'm going. There's a lot of miserable stuff going on, and I, right now I'm finding a little happiness here. I've been happier as well. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's nice. I looked we're, at. I looked we're all, at we're with Sean's, our friends. Sean's smiling face. <laughs> Sean, as he's laughing at my yeah. delivery, and it just that air of judgment yeah. just right behind the eyes. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> Okay, here we go. All right, this this one is. <laughs> you ever see those uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken outtakes? Yeah, we you know, talking about the Sanders. Sanders. Oh, yeah. oh, the yeah. poor man. Bless this is the heart. good one. Yeah. That's it. Finger, 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 looking, finger, finger, looking. It's the best chat ever. You know, he's he was pretty old at that time. And then he got nervous. Yeah, yeah, But if if you've never heard them, you have to find them because they are pretty special. Yeah. Or the, the Orson Welles one for the wine. Do you remember? Uh, oh, my God. Yeah. Well, that's oh, the yeah. funniest that's thing the ever funny. in the, the world. I mean, I mean, he had been drinking I've the wine. As, as, uh, yes. <laughs> also, the video one of that, the yeah. Palmasan that's it. commercial. That's, yes. Yeah, that's the one. Oh, yeah. goes, that yeah. one's ah, great. He starts out saying, ah, the oh, fresh. And, the and fr- each time, <laughs> oh, yeah. the ah gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. So he goes, ah. And you know what I always fresh. love is I love the background actors. Yes, exactly. They are so professional. Totally professional. Because I would have just went... As soon as he went, I would have like. <laughs> what was, what was, it, what was it, it for again? It was for, for Palmas on wine. It was wine. Palmas on wine, I think. Yeah. And you had this, the, the, right. this this lovely couple that they're holding this bottle of wine. They have to turn it a certain way and mm-hmm. pour it, and and they like Matt said, they're total pros. Take after yeah. they, they, it's flawless. Yeah, but it's Orson who just goes into these. <laughs> yeah. Oh my! And gosh. then have you ever watched the final product? You would never know. Oh really? Yeah. No. Yeah. No. No, it's incredible. That's the magic of Speaking of chicken, your rap name, extra crispy. <laughs> you know what? I like, I like pretty that. Good, right? You know, I can I live like with that. that. Yeah, that's not bad. Can it's you extra X T R A? Yeah. Oh no, it's got to be a lot of K's and yeah, yeah. yeah I like so that. X got kippy. No, no, extra, extra, extra and crispy, crispy with a K. With a K. Yeah. Can yes. you imagine? Put your hands together. For rap star extra crispy. Hey, <laughs> I like big bugs and I cannot lie. <laughs> yeah, I like Harrison it. played the fly. I, li- I like it a lot. A get, lot. <clears throat> should I get back to this? Yes. All right. Now I don't Did even know where fart? to start. Oh, no, it's the chair. No, no. 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 
Just, you know, just come out for the first bit. <laughs> I love it when anyone does that. <laughs> Shut up. You know, John, maybe I should just start. John, uh, maybe should, Johnny Smith. Maybe I should just start from the beginning. <laughs> okay. No? <laughs> if you want to, I don't. Want to. We've wasted enough time already, <laughs> okay, so here we why go. not? Here we go. <clears throat> I'd also like to give a special thanks to our sponsors at Creature Features. Yay! Now, listeners, I want you guys to check out, go to CreatureFeatures.com. Go to their website, because on that website, you'll see that they are sponsoring this amazing exhibit, this Rod Sirloin. <laughs> <laughs> That's your that's your rap name, Rod, Rod Sirloin. Sirloin. That should be it. the next figure. <laughs> yeah, like a meat, that Sea meat, Demon Toys does, man, like a meat <laughs> monster yeah. in, a, in a tuxedo. Yeah, oh, yeah. So Rod Sirloin. Sirloin. Awesome. Oh, guys, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry, <laughs> Rod Sirloin. God, I want a steak now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me try that again. You're <clears throat> traveling through a broiler. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would be a Twilight Zone episode. Another Can you imagine? Of heat. Like being of salt and fork. pepper. <clears throat> Maybe some garlic. Okay. A bit of butter. End time. <laughs> some Bernays. So, when I do the, on that note, so what was it? Was the uh, Keep America Strong um, experience and experience the fantastic worlds of William Stout or what, what was it? What weird. Uh, well, we, we called it. Weird our, our, so we're using our version. Well, I don't know what you guys, uh, should we be consistent? Pay a visit to the weird worlds yes. of William Stout. Oh, I like that. And, yeah. and, beware of the aquatic and beware of the aquatic wrath of the leopard yeah. seals. Should it be the Arctic? Uh, uh, Antarctic. Antarctic. Leopard be seal. aware of oh, Jesus Christ. You want to write it down? You want a pen? No, I just want to, I need to it's get it in my head. a lot of head. information. And be aware of the aquatic wrath of the Antarctic leopard seal. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. You can't do better than that. No. no. Print it. <laughs> All right. You don't want to write it down? No. I, you got it up there, huh? In your noggin. Okay. So, Bill, I hear you have a great story, by the way. <laughs> really? Oh, <Yeah>. Really? <laughs> you know, is that That is how we're getting into this. Really? Wow. Well, well, was, there's so you much know what? I was just to, thinking about great was, stories. There's so much. <laughs> and I thought, Bill. <laughs> yeah, but there's a great story you've got for us. So my favorite thing about working in movies mm-hmm. is the stories I come away with from each experience. Mm-hmm. This happened on the remake of Invaders from Mars. Okay. Mm. So we had contacted the United States Air Force uh, because we need a lot of military vehicles and, and help in that mm-hmm. area. And they hadn't gotten back to us. And I was starting to get nervous because the shooting day was looming and we really needed that gear in those vehicles. Mm-hmm. So I called them up and they said, we're sorry, we cannot cooperate in the making of your motion picture. I said, why? You guys are the heroes. You're the good guys. You saved the day. You kill the Martians. You, you're, you know, there's no downside to that. Right. He said, it is the official position of the United States Air Force that there are no UFOs and there are no Martians. I'm what? Like, are you kidding me? Come on. Is that, that's the reason you're not going to help us? Oh, my God. I thought, we're screwed. We're sunk. Well, our storyboard artist, Keith Crosley, comes up to me, hands me a card. He says, call this guy. And there was a name on it that said, United States Marine Corps Public Relations Liaison Officer. I said, okay. So I called him up. He said, son, send me a script. I said, I will messenger a script. You'll have it within an hour. Mm-hmm. And so I sent somebody over the script. This time I didn't wait. I called the next day. I said, did you read the screenplay? He says, yes, I read the screenplay. I said, so the Marines going to help us out? He said, you will have the full cooperation of the United States Marine Corps. And I said, so there's no problem with the uh, Marine Corps' official position of uh, UFOs and Martians? He said, son, it is the official position of the United States Marine Corps that the United States Marines have no qualms whatsoever about killing Martians. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) And then did Zsa Zsa Gabor come in and go, Toby, Toby! This is not like Chainsaw. <laughs> there are no Martians. I don't know what, <laughs> what, what accent, accent I'm doing. It started <laughs> off as Zsa Zsa it and then Charo. it turned into Charo. Yes, but I will right. say this. That is a great story. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> That's a good yeah. story. 